133 miles today to the city of Rouen. The longest stage of the first week is also oddly built for speed, as these amateurs are discovering. As for the pros, well, they will finish up here, about 150 meters from our studio. Hey everyone, I'm Liam McHugh. Welcome to Tour de France Live, presented by Cadillac. Today is July the 4th, a day of celebration back in the States. But here in France, many of the athletes are simply celebrating the fact that they are still in this race. And that's because yesterday, it was a stage three that was full of carnage. We began the day with the full field, 198 riders still intact. But yesterday's crashes forced three men to abandon and left countless others banged up bloodied and bruised. And with those positive words, I bring in Bob Roll. We are in Roi, the River Seine behind us, the Cathedral Notre Dame, a beautiful backdrop for us. As for yesterday, it was not really a beautiful day on the course for stage number three, American Tom Danielson. He finished eighth in the tour last year. When we left you last night, we told you, separated shoulder, Danielson was headed to the hospital. We now know he starts stage four, but let's face it, he's not 100%. So how does that affect both his goals and the goals of his team, Garmin Sharp? Well, the Tour de France, if anything, is a wicked taskmaster. Even when you do everything right, staying in the front, staying out of trouble, you can have some bad luck. That has befallen Tom Danielson. He's made his Tour de France debut last year. He had a great tour, came across the finish line with, obviously, favoring that shoulder that had it turned out been separated but for Tommy D he, he lost nine minutes and 11 seconds on the stage so that effectively ends his chances in the overall standings it does however clarify things a little bit for his team Garmin and they can now concentrate their efforts on Ryder Hage at all so for Tommy D bad luck to lose that much time but it also frees him up perhaps to go for a stage win in the mountains so we did have that crisp video you saw right there of Tom Danielson after the race clearly favoring that right shoulders we scanned through the video though couldn't really get a great shot or see where or how he was injured Craig Harmer checked in with his team to find out more here at the Garmin Sharp bus this morning Tom Danielson told me he believes it was Robbo Banks Martin Tolingi who crashed in front of him he was right in the middle of the peloton which usually is the safest place to be but when Tolingi went down Danielson could not avoid him he landed directly on that shoulder that was separated initially he said it was numb but became increasingly painful as he worked his way towards the finish Tolingi meanwhile finished the stage as well eventually being diagnosed with a fractured left hip and unfortunately he has now been forced to abandon the tour. There's another Tom by the way who's on injured reserve that's Europe cars Thomas Vokler. You remember his sensational run in yellow last year. High hopes for him coming into this year's tour. However, he did have a knee injury before the tour started. He exacerbated it yesterday, losing over seven minutes to Sagan, the stage winner. Vokler has now said only time will tell to see whether or not he can do anything to impress his fans by the time we reach Paris. Gentlemen, three perfect examples why you have to be more than tough if you want to choose the profession of cycling. Toughness certainly helps. Luck definitely plays a factor. We had three days in Belgium to start the tour, three fairly clean days. We'd bring the Tour de France into France and crashes in stage three and fairly early on. And this was just really an odd one, Bob. This is a very odd crash. It seems as if the peloton is going to get around this safely, this traffic island. But then the Lamprey rider right in the middle of your screen falls down, takes Yanni Brockovich, the GC contender from the Astana team, right down. Brockovich didn't even have a chance to let go of the handlebars and he fell heavily right on his back. So he gets up at crash number two. The road's getting a little bit narrow here. Traffic jam leads to this crash. This sky rider on the ground there is Konstantin Zivsov, and that could be a big factor in Bradley Wiggins' chances in the mountains. Broken leg for Zivsov. He's out of the Tour de France. Fracture tibia. You see him try to get up. He thinks better of it, sits down. He is out of the Tour. Our third crash, a messy one here. We see Simon Garrens on the right side of your screen. We'll have a better view of that. He flips over his bike, goes into the barbed wire. Guess what? He's fine. You can't say that about the other riders, though. No, J.J. Rojas, the sprinter on the Movistar squad, he causes the crash. He goes down first. Riders plowing over him. He's out of the Tour de France. Simon Garrett's into the barbed wire, obviously not made out of chocolate. He bounces <laughs> up and finishes the stage. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, remarkable that he is still fine and he's still going. J.J. Rojas, uh, a sad ending for him. But this was really odd because now we're coming down the stretch here about what 200 meters away from the finish what happens this is only about 10 riders back from the front this is what happens when you're exhausted you're sprinting you're asphyxiated with the effort and it 
it def it effectively it ruins the chances for anybody to the side or behind you. That's why you have to be so close to the front as long as you can be. Certainly a messy stage number three. Here is the injury report. As we told you, three riders forced to abandon. We began with 198, but down to 195. Craig Hummer provided you with all the details of Tom Danielson. Philippe Gilbert, well, the shin gash is what it's listed as. This is what it looks like via Twitter. It doesn't look like a lot of fun. One of the most tender parts of the human body is the shin. Very little muscle to protect that shin bone. Philippe Gilbert is going to have a tough stage, at least until he gets that warmed up. This is John Paolo Caruso. Uh, not a good night at the bars and a horrible day at the Tour de France. It makes it so very difficult to recuperate when you have to... Uh, it almost looks like everything. a car ran over him at that point. Not to make light of it, it looks uh, extremely painful. This was the, the odd one because we found out... You finish the stage, you go to the hospital, and you find out, oh, I fractured my hip. Yeah. So how tough do you have to be to finish? And then the final one, uh, Konstantin Sitov for Team Sky, that broken leg, the full cast right there. So certainly uh, a lot of negative in stage number three, but there was one huge positive takeaway from all of this, the debut tour of 22-year-old Peter Sagan. Well, he wins his second stage. What impressed you the most about yesterday's ride? I think his versatility. He, uh, he also, his teammates, they were very impressive. They had to do a big chase of the breakaway, and then even Ivan Basso had to come to the front and chase down Sylvain Chavanel, who put in a massive attack at the end. If Basso didn't go to the front to catch Chavanel, Sagan would not have won the stage. So let's take a look at the footage here. Peter Sagan, victory down the stretch. How much strength and skill does he show here? Coming on the outside there, not the ideal line, but he still has plenty to spare. We say the sky is the limit for this young man. You can see why it's not even close. Still a few meters to go before the finish line. But by the time he gets near the finish line, he has distanced himself from his rivals by so far. He has plenty of time to celebrate. You mentioned Sylvain Chavanel. Uh, we watch this. We'll have more on the celebrations later on. It's become a theme here at the Tour de France. As we take a closer look at what he is calling the Forest Gump. You know, if you're going to do it, you might as well name them. <laughs> you mentioned Sylvain Chavanel. Excellent rider. Yes, absolutely. Experienced rider. So he makes a move pretty early on, and he says that I'm making the move because I'm thinking about Peter Sagan. What does it say that this 22-year-old is already in the heads of experienced riders? Well, he has an absolutely incredible amount of natural talent. That acceleration, so blistering, incinerated the field. So if you're anybody else in the bike race on that type of stage yesterday, you have to do something else. Sylvain Chavanel, desperate for a stage when he's very close to the yellow jersey as well, He's thinking, I think I'm going to have to go about five kilometers from the finish and hope for the best. It didn't work out for Chavanel on yesterday's stage, but he'll keep trying. But it does say a lot about Peter Sagan, one of the best in the business. Do not want to come near the finish line with you. They know they'll lose. That's incredible. Peter Sagan, he is in the green jersey. It is the sprinter's jersey. But remember the yellow jersey? We used to talk about it all the time back in the day. Here are your Michelob Ultra overall standings. Fabian Cancellara, he's still on top of things. He's wearing the yellow jersey. Bradley Wiggins, the overall favorite coming into this year's tour. He remains in second, just seven seconds back. It's the 4th of July, and in the fourth spot, it is the American, the 23-year-old TJ Van Garderen. Ed Waldo Hassenhagen in, fi in fifth place. He's on the Sky Team, but look at Cadell Evans. It's a good position, seventh overall, but still 10 seconds behind Bradley Wiggins. It's a sunny stage number four here at the Tour de France and we have a three-man breakaway. Three leaders about a little bit above eight-minute lead on the peloton here. We, as the video freezes up a little bit, we do know that Moncloutier is one of them and a legit threat in him. Oh, most certainly. David Moncloutier, two times a stage winner in the Tour de France already. He is a breakaway hunter. If the peloton gets it wrong, the breakaway stands a chance. But only three riders in the break. Also, uh, Iris Shiro, he's from the Europa Car team, and Della Place from Saur. The sprinters don't have a lot of chances in this year's Tour de France. Not a big breakaway, and uh, you'll, you can expect a big... So a breakaway yesterday, we thought perhaps that it could last. Today, the stage does not set up that way? No, the, the chances are much <laughs> lower today on the dead flat finish. A lot of guys with a chance to win, so all of their teammates will be focused on catching the breakaway before the finish. These are some early pictures of stage four, not the official feed. When we get the official French feed, we will bring it to you. Tour de France Live presented by Cadillac rolls on and it rolls on with Phil Liggett and Paul Sherwin providing predictions for stage number four. That's next. The 2012 Tour de France Live on the NBC Sports Network is presented by Cadillac, the new standard of the world. Stay off.
are coming at a real rush now. Cancellara and Sagan are going in the middle as they break on the right as well. Oh, there's a crack that's broken up the peloton. Sagan is over the top. Now we'll see the finishing line. Sagan is coming clear to win his second stage. Cancellara will keep yellow as Sagan gets it. Is there any stopping this man? He's dancing all the way to the line. Sagan, the first rider born in the 1990s to win a stage of the Tour de France as we take a look at live pictures. And now he has two stage wins as we take a look right here, Bob. Still a three-man lead for stage number four. They have a chance, any, anywhere from zero to none chance to stay away before the finish. But that does not mean they won't get a lot of publicity for their sponsors. And one of the things of the Tour de France, especially for the French teams, is about uh, in, endearing themselves to the home crowd. And that's a good move for those three men. No chance in the sprint. you got to do something. As you can see, it is hot, it is sunny, it's also long 133 miles. But built for speed, let's fire up the Geico stage map. Bob Roll with a guided tour. We're going to start in the northwest. We're going to head towards the coast. Abbeville is a start town. Rouen is the finishing town. Kind of a long stage today. There are four climbs out on the race course for the first day in this year's Tour de France. Michael Morkov has not made the breakaway. Those points will go to somebody else. He still has enough to keep the King of the Mountain jersey, at least for another day. Finish in Rouen, 133 miles later. This is a sprinters paradise this stage is built for the sprinters and they should be battling it out in the last few kilometers so that's the stage and here are the stage four facts if i mentioned the four climbs all cat four climbs as for that intermediate sprint point to keep an eye on it's coming at you at 74 and a half kilometers to go so we're calling this a sprinter stage we, well you've said what six maybe seven sprinter stages is this is one of those officially a true sprinter stage today yes most definitely it's dead flat as a pancake the last five ten kilometers all the teams will be jockeying for position trying to not only get their sprinter in the right position for the sprint but also navigating the traffic all the traffic furniture what happens also is the gc riders want to be in front and that's why we see so much dramatic racing footage in the final five kilometers or three miles of these stages it's absolute chaos out there you're talking about that final 5k those final three miles we do see a little bit of a climb right before that what kind of challenge does that pose for the true sprinters like a mark cavendish well it's a cat four at the most so they should be able to roll over that without too much trouble at all also there's a tremendous amount of inertia in the peloton as long as you start in the front this last climb you should have enough roadway to filter back and still be in the peloton by the time you get to the top and then get back into the position that's why the teammates are so important on a stage like this not just for the final lead out but for all of the miles leading into the finishing town that is what to expect when you're expecting stage four heading to Rouen the Cadillac performance predictions that's right the moment of great significance the time you've been waiting for and here are the standings all Phil Liggett does is pick winners. He has 12 points. He led wire to wire last year. He leads again. Paul Sherwin has eight points. Bob Roll has 10 points. The good news is that Bob Roll, you pick first. Now, last year on July the 4th, you went out, you picked the American Tyler Farrer. He rewarded you. He won his first stage at the Tour de France. Repeat pick. Uh, if I want to get some points against Phil Liggett, I had better <laughs> choose a little bit more prudently, perhaps. Tyler Farrah, not on great form this year, hasn't won a race throughout the season, not quite firing on all cylinders. Also, they have a very legitimate chance to win the Tour de France with Ryder Hagedal, Canadian rider who just won the Giro d'Italia a few weeks ago. So I think they'll be concentrating their efforts on protecting Ryder Hagedal and not doing the lead-out for Tyler Farrah. It leads me to believe that the, another rider most notably Mark Cavendish mm. has a better chance to win. So you're going with Mark Cavendish, looking to pick up his 22nd stage victory. Paul Sherwin, Paul and Phil are over the booth right by the finish. Paul, you got a little work to do today. Who do you like now that Cavendish is off the board? Well, I don't like Bob for a start, because I think he should have been a little <laughs> bit more patriotic today on the 4th of July. So yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> if Mark Cavendish makes a mistake, well, it's going to be a big German by the name of Andre Greipel who's going to go across the line in first place. I think Cavendish will win because he's uh, actually on form, firing on all cylinders. But watch out for the German because he's a pretty fast man. Well, I think July the 4th, Liam, could be the day best remembered for the day the Brit loses the yellow jersey because as the third man to pick today, and we're not allowed to pick the same name, I'm bringing out my reserve rider who will win a stage this week, I'm sure, and I'm hoping it's today. Matty Goss, the Australian on Orica Green Edge, is my pick today. I think, uh, I think he's in with a chance. I know he's looking for the win. I don't know if you'll lose a yellow. Either way, can we see the yellow up? on you if it is the last time for a little bit <laughs> phil you've had it for so long you look great in yellow it's uh, could do with a wash actually <laughs> <laughs>
Guys, thanks so much. Good luck on your picks. Enjoy the stage. Right now, let's take another sneak peek, a live look at some of the racing action. Stage number four of the Tour de France. As we fire up the video from the helicopter right here, we're taking a good look at the peloton. Fabian Cancellar has not made one mistake defending his yellow jersey throughout the first week of racing. I don't expect Radio Shack, one of the best teams in the business, to do that. They've been helped by the Sprinters team throughout today's stage. Lotto's been on the front quite a bit as well. The team of Andre Greipel. So a very solid day for the Radio Shack team. And Fabian Cancellara should be able to keep the yellow jersey on today's stage. We're eager to see who wins. We're eager to see how they celebrate that win. That's a topic that we'll discuss next on Tour de France Live. We will also have a conversation with Matt Goss. Tour de France Live rolls on after this. Tour de France Live on the NBC Sports Network is presented by Cadillac, the new standard of the world. Just beautiful, beautiful video that we're seeing as the riders go along the northern coast of France. The lead group, well, we have a three-man lead group, about 650 up now. The gap's narrowing just a bit, Bob, and we're getting into some climbs, some Cat 4 climbs. Jens Voigt on the front of the peloton from the Radio Shack squad of the Yellow Jersey. Fabian Cancellar could probably take about six minutes out of the breakaway by himself. Here's where the riders have gone so far. Those are the Cat 4 climbs out on the course. Saxo Bank rider Michael Morkoff from the track. Not the world's greatest climber, presumably, but the king of the mountain so far. He's not in the breakaway for the first time in the Tour de France. So three other riders will get those King of the Mountain points, but he'll have enough to keep the jersey at the end of the day. As we inch closer to complete live racing, we welcome in Scott Moniger. Scott, so many crashes yesterday in Stage 3. We had several riders injured. We had three riders abandoned. Big picture, the overall, how does this affect the chase for the yellow jersey? You know, it definitely affects Team Sky and their quest for the yellow jersey. They brought, uh, they brought on Konstantin Sitsov, especially to help Wiggins in the mountains. Specifically, I think they looked at the course, and they realized that the one place that BMC was going to take shots at them was going to be in the high mountains situation where Wiggins might be isolated against Cadell and another teammate. So having, you know, having somebody to shepherd Wiggins through those high mountains, they're really, really going to miss Sitsov. So it's basically now eight guys doing the work that would have been nine guys. Crash is, of course, part of the big story of stage three, but you really can't go anywhere in France right now without hearing people talk about Peter Sagan. I don't speak French, but I've been translating. He assures me they are talking about Peter Sagan, and this is why. <laughs> the celebrations, not just the wins. This is a man, 22 years old, but he's got panache. He's got serious panache, a stroke of brilliance every time he wins. This, this is the review's incredible. mixed. Yeah. The this, reviews are mixed. This is Robbie Hunter from the Garmin Squad tweeting. Yes, great win by Sagan. Again, he is class, but can't say I enjoy his victory salutes in the face of his competitors. As for his teammate David Miller, a different take on the subject. He tweets out, totally for Sagan and his crazy salutes. He's 22. He's got plenty of time to grow old and dignified. Not the first time people have celebrated in the Tour de France, of course. And this looks really familiar. <laughs> this is Robbie <laughs> McEwen, the Dumb and Dumber running man. Great one. This is Juan Antonio Fletcher drawing back his bow. Fletcher, arrow in Spanish. That was a nice one. Very classy. I like that one quite a bit. That was in the 03 Tour de France. Here's the binky of Carlos Sastre, his wife giving birth during the tour. He wasn't there. I'm not sure how he hid that pacifier throughout the stage they, of the tour. Though. Did they outlaw <laughs> props after that? Because at this point, wouldn't you just have the phone? <laughs> <laughs> Of course, Mark Cavendish, listen, obviously, not you, you heard from Robbie Hunter, not everyone's thrilled with his antics. My take on it is, I like his celebrations, I think they're good-natured, and I like that Robbie Hunter doesn't like them. I like that it <laughs> bothers him a little bit. As former riders, would it bother you? You know, I think this is just a reflection of Peter Sagan's personality. You know, he's, he's obviously gotten bored with the normal one-hand, two-hand salute. We're on victory number 14, number 15 here. He's just kind of ran, you know, he's digging into the, the bag of tricks and seeing what he can come up with, and I'm personally looking forward to seeing what he does for number three. As riders, would you gather around as a team? Would this be discussed, and would it motivate? I think if you're one of his competitors, it would definitely be discussed. And, and some of the sprinters, some of the lead-out men that he is clearly beating might not be thrilled with it. But for Sagan's teammates, everybody can now contribute to how he should uh, salute the crowd when he wins another race. I don't think this is the end of Sagan's winning streak <laughs> either by a long stretch. For me personally, endurance athletes, let's face it, they're not the most garrulous bunch of people in the world. Very cerebral group. And to see somebody with the exuberance and the talent of Peter Sagan is very refreshing. And the bottom line is, if you don't like watching the guy celebrate, go out there and beat him. It's not <laughs> the only thing that he's winning. He's winning the green jersey standings. The sprinter's jersey is the green.
jersey. He is on top, Peter Sagan. He has 116 points already. Fabian Cancellara there with 74. Mark Cavendish, who won the green jersey last year, in there with 73. And Matthew Goss, who we thought would contend to it contend for that green jersey he has 55 points as we take a live look at the peloton here i want to ask you when we saw the lead and we saw the green jerseys i know it's early in the race but is that too much of a gap between peter sagan and mark cavendish it's looking like a landslide already for peter sagan it's uh, no limit to how he can win the sprints also the intermediate sprints to come throughout the rest of the tour de france if he starts going for those gets himself over a couple of tall mountains early in the stage which is not beyond his capabilities it's going to be one of the biggest winning margins in the history of the tour for the green jersey. Is it too great right now? I mean, Cavendish, a stage like this sets up for him. You figure the intermediate sprints, he has the advantage over Sagan as well. You know, on paper, it actually is more, uh, it does favor Cavendish more because the flatter stages have more points. You get uh, 45 points for a flat stage win, whereas a medium mountain, you only get 30 points. Having said that, you know, the overall difference in, in first and second last year on the final green jersey tally was about 60 points. And again, Sagan is leading by 40 points. So certainly the, the advantage looks to be going in his favor. Matthew Goss competing for that green jersey. So far, the field sprints haven't been his forte. He has looked very strong, however, in the intermediate sprints. Earlier today, before the race, he chatted with Steve Perino. Matt, obviously a tough day for the team yesterday. And as you guys assess and look towards today, adjustments that you would make to stay out of any kind of trouble? Ah, oh, look, you know, yesterday was a stressful day. I don't think today is going to be much different, but we did everything right yesterday. It was uh, just unfortunate we got caught in the crash. We were all really, really well positioned up the front of the bunch, but the, the crash happened right at the very front of the bunch, and unfortunately we just got taken out on either side of it. But, uh, you know, we will do everything we've been doing, and we've been very consistent, and uh, we'll get the guys together and have another go at the sprint today. Um, with the green jersey getting a little further out of reach yesterday, how do you assess the way you'll approach today, the intermediates versus the final sprint? But we'll still we'll still keep chipping away. It's a long way to Paris. It's uh, another two and two and a half weeks. And uh, you know, the day before yesterday, we took 15 points out of Sagan. So we'll keep trying to do that. And if we can do that day after day, then you know, we we could still be in with a shot. We're not going to give up just yet. But obviously, the the stage is the most important thing, and uh, we'll try and win that. So game time decision as far as the intermediates go, and uh, who's out in front. Yeah, exactly. We'll assess how many guys are in the breakaway, if it's worth going for, if it's worth saving the energy. But uh, you know, first and foremost, we'll try and win the stage at the end of the day. Uh, it has been said that a little bit more chaos anticipated and that we have seen with the sprints because fewer trains, more guys trying their luck at it. Do you uh, embrace the chaos? Look, I've got a great team, so I don't have to worry too much about it. You know, hopefully the guys try and line up behind us because we've, we've got one of the stronger lead-out trains here. So hopefully these guys can keep me out of trouble and uh, a lot of the chaos is behind. That's our ideal situation. All right. Good luck to you. Appreciate it. As we take uh, another look at live pictures of stage four of the Tour de France, let's continue to talk about the sprinters. At times, even though sprinting is such an individual event by nature, it is a team event here in the Tour de France. You have a lead-out group, essentially guys who put you in proper position to make a run at an intermediate sprint or a run at a field sprint. Matthew Goss has a great lead-out train, so does Andre Greipel. Who do you think has the better one? You know, I'd, I'd love to get Bob's two cents on this, but I think Australians are some of the toughest lot out there. I've, I've raced with and against Australians throughout my career, and these guys do not know uncle. They really don't know what that, that is. I mean, they will not give up. This is their Tour de France debut for Orica Green Edge, and they're here with one mission, to win, to win uh, stages and to win the green jersey. So uh, they are not going to go down without a, a serious, serious fight. Andre Greipel has a train, but it's not the full team that Matt Goss enjoys. I have to agree with you, Scott, on this. It's a... Uh, one guy on his team, Belgian rider, uh, Jurgen Vandenbroek, fifth in the Tour de France a couple of years ago, crashed out last year. And for a Belgian team to have a Belgian rider as a GC contender, a lot of their uh, energy is dedicated to keeping him out of trouble, not necessarily doing the sprints for Andre Greipel. He still does have one secret weapon, though, and that's Greg Henderson, one of the best lead-out men in the business. It could be a great stage today. <laughs> stage four, a stage for sprinter, sprinters. Matthew Goss, Andre, Andre Greipel, Mark Cavendish, who knows, perhaps the American, Tyler Farrer, could come in and steal a stage. To keep up with the Tour de France, you'll need the most advanced digital experience of its kind. Go to NBCSports.com slash TDF Live and get Tour de France Live for a limited time. Get Tour de France Live for just $29.99. Stage 4 of the 2012 Tour de France, the 99th Tour de France. Live coverage coming at you. Phil Liggett, Paul Sherwin, they have the call. Next.
At last the sun is shining and reflecting off the Alabaster coastline here as we continue our journey down from northern France. 214 and a half kilometers, that's 133 miles, a long way between Abbeville and Rouen today. And we join the action immediately with a breakaway that has started right out at the beginning again. Looking down from the helicopter, our first glimpse of the peloton. They're getting a little bit of a move on right now, Paul, because uh, they've lost quite a lot of time today. It looks like a ripply day today, Phil, but we hardly go more than 100 metres or 300 feet above sea level. The fourth category climbs, three of them already behind us. The feeding station is on the horizon, and uh, very shortly there is also a very important sprint point when the riders go through Fécon, and then they turn inland to head down towards Rouen. Well, the Radio Shack boys on the left of our picture looking after their man in the yellow jersey. That's a very uh, typical uh, chase at the moment. Uh, Lotto also prepared to help here because they've got Andre Greipel as a likely sprinter. It's been an early morning breakaway again that's proved a point. And up front, David Moncoutier, a Frenchman who once won on Bastille Day at Dean Les Bains, has snapped up the three single points for the three hills so far. So in a couple of days, he might challenge our Danish leader there in Morkov. Here they are, Arashio, one of only two Japanese riders to finish the Tour de France in history. David Moncoutier is in the red, and Anthony Delaplace of the Sears Sojourn uh, team. They're the three escapers today. Between them, they've ridden 15 tours de France. Yeah, a little bit of action at the back. The doctor has been extremely busy, I have to say, Phil, uh, over the last uh, 48 hours because there's been an awful lot of crashes. He's been doing his best to look after everybody and uh, keep them up and getting them back onto their bikes. Rather an interesting story yesterday because uh, Martin Jelingi finished the stage and then when he went to hospital they found out that he actually had a crack in his hip and so he wasn't able to start this morning. Yes, he'd, uh, it was a clean break, as his team told us this morning, which indicated that, uh, for that reason, he didn't feel the excruciating pain of a fracture, uh, and he was able to finish the stage, but sadly he's out of the race. It's a little bit of a sadness for us, because he's quite a character, and he's, uh, he's weakened, of course, his Rabobank team now, which are trying to support the Amgen Tour of California winner, Robert Gessing, uh, to win this Tour de France. Yeah, we've got some magnificent views today. The riders, are from once they get to the coastline at Dieppe, they follow this coastline for a long, long time. It's nicknamed the Alabaster Coast because of these uh, magnificent uh, limestone rocks with a little bit of a, a grey, black flint intrusion. And then the bad news is uh, the Alabaster coastline is receding at the rate of one metre a year. And so don't buy any of those houses on the top there. These are the leaders. Uh, the, this is the man who started the break, uh, Yukiya Ya Arashiro. He rides for Team Eurocar, has the, uh, the uh, honor of being one of the first Japanese riders ever to finish the Tour de France, which he did a couple of years ago. Uh, two I suppose theoretically he wasn't the first because he actually finished behind the other <laughs> Japanese rider who finished the same year. Looking into the face here of Anthony de Laplace, he's already been in the breakaway uh, very early on. He's 148th overall. But the man who uh, I find it a bit strange to see him here at the Tour de France is uh, the man in the red jersey because David Moncoutier at the start of this season said, now I'm not going to ride the Tour de France this year, I'm too old, it's too hard, I want to uh, dedicate myself to the Vuelta a España where he's been the winner four times of the King of the Mountains classification. And here he is in the Tour and in the breakaway. Yes, and he's never led the King of the Mountains even in the Tour de France either. And it's most unusual for a Frenchman uh, to win the King of the Mountains in the Tour of Spain. Uh, because the Spanish have some very good climbers, but this will be his last season as a pro and uh, I think that's why he's been persuaded to have one more final crack at what is his 11th Tour de France now. Yeah, he's won two stages in the past, in fact uh, one time he won on the 14th of July. Today is the American national holiday, Independence Day, but of course the uh, big day for France is the 14 juillet. There's Jens Voigt in the black jersey of Radio Shack Nissan and a big smile on the face of Fabian Cancellara. I wonder if anybody can take that yellow jersey away from him before we get into the Jura Mountains. So Jens Voigt, our man of the pacemaking early on in Team Radio Shack. Uh, let's have a little bit more about Jens. Always smiling even when he's in trouble and under effort. This man will not have an easy race because he causes himself so much pain. He was twice a stage winner of the Tour. He's briefly worn the yellow jersey as well. And we've seen that terrible crash he had a few years back as well. He is all okay at the moment and he's doing a lot of work just now. Now we've got a problem here and this is the Argus ride at the back. It's uh, Jan uh, Hugo of France, 180th overall, the Argus rider and uh, he's off and running. 
routine at the moment, Paul, but the wind might catch them a little bit along this coast now. Well, they'll have to be very attentive because the wind, when it comes in off the uh, English Channel here, it does really tend to uh, rip the riders up from the, the right-hand side or uh, the left-hand side of the screen. And if you're not attentive and riding at the front end, and if somebody decides to put the hammer down, you'll see this main field split into four or five different groups. You can see your Radio Shack there adopting exactly the same tactic that they've adopted uh, since uh, Fabian Cancelar got himself the overall lead. They're sitting at the front, making a, a tempo just to lock that breakaway in. They know that in the latter part of this race they will get assistance from the teams of the sprinters. I've seen on occasions Liqui Gas coming forward because they're of course wondering whether or not their man Peter Sagan can get himself win number three. Just looking down there, Paul, and when they get to Fecon, they will swing inland away from that coastline, and then they'll realise they're not that far from the finish in Rouen. It'll be the 20th time we've been to Rouen with the Tour de France. 12 Tour de France on the NBC Sports Network is presented by Michelob Ultra, the superior light beer perfectly balanced for the ultralight. By Competitive Cyclist, Get 20% off cycling apparel and accessories by visiting competitivecyclist.com forward slash TDF and use promo code TDF20. By Strava, track your rides and compete against friends, locals and pros. Go to strava.com to get started. And by Trade. see for yourself why investors are saying, I'm with Trade. Let's have a look then, the USA Cycling American standings overall, TJ Van Garden holding on to his fourth place despite a hard ride yesterday, Levi Leipheimer 45 seconds behind, Chris Horner losing a little bit of time, 47, George Hincapi there at 57th overall, see if we can show you uh, what happened to poor old uh, Tommy Danson yesterday because he had that accent, he is further down in the overall situation there he is in 126 now losing nine minutes 41 seconds very unlucky christian van der velde 229 farrah who won on this day a year ago uh, 12 52 off the pace anyway we can go to the start of this morning and before the riders went away craig hummer was with he, with tom danielson just to find out uh, how he was feeling Tom, by now everyone knows the aftermath but i don't think many people know how it happened describe how you got the separated shoulder yeah, I mean, I don't really remember it super good, but we were just going really fast down a descent, and I was actually riding good position, I think, in the top 30 guys, and was in the middle. Usually the crashes happen on the sides, you know, so I tried to stay in the middle, and there was a crash on the side, but the Rabobank guy, which uh, I guess it was Talingi, he, he went down right in front of me, and uh, I did a pretty good job to avoid him. But uh, someone smashed me from behind, and and I was was uh, kind of off to, you know, one left foot out, and he was on my right side. So I was trying to break break as much as possible, and someone smashed me from my uh, left side, and I just went over the handlebars and and straight on my shoulder. So uh, you know, initially when I got back up, I knew it was just really numb and it felt really strange. But uh, with all the chaos and, you know, you, you work all year for the Tour de France and, and uh, your form's good. So you don't think anything of it. You just try to straighten your handlebars and go. And um, my derailleur was, was uh, broken as well, but I just kept going. And as soon as we hit a hill, um, you know, I tried to pull on my handlebars and I couldn't pull with my arm. And, and then I, I had to slow down a little bit and then my derailleur ripped off into my into my into my spokes so then i just sat on the side of the road and waited for a bike and and uh at that point i knew that my shoulder was wrecked and and uh so i just did everything i could to get to the finish line it was really really challenging i'm uh, thankful for my teammates they, they waited with me and, and got me to the finish line well your game time decision is to get on the start line today what have the doctors done to get you ready to possibly be able to get through the day yeah, I mean, uh, the biggest thing, I guess, is taping it. You know, it's all taped together, and it's actually more uncomfortable now because it's pushed together, but uh, maybe, maybe that'll make it easier to ride my bike. I'm not really sure. And then, of course, uh, a little bit of uh, medication to help uh, take, the, take the side of, or take the effects off a little bit, but still it, it hurts like a, a lot. And uh, 
I kind of have this sharp shooting pain going down my arm right now, so it's definitely going to be a, a tough day for sure for me. All right, good luck dealing with it all. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes, indeed. Well done, Tom. Well, this man's having his second flat tire of the day here, Paul. This again is the um, uh, team of Argos Shimano ride at Jan Huge. Yeah, well, they will, they'll be hoping that uh, it'll all come back together down towards the end and hope that their man Marcel Kittel has recovered. He was having a little bit of a stomach infection over the first couple of days and wasn't able to show us uh, the great sprinter that he is. It's a great array of sprinters assembled here at the Tour de France and one man who's not been involved in any of the sprints but he's been at the front of the main field all the time, Cadell Evans. He's coming back here, I think, Phil, probably just been down for a, a nature break. No panic on board the Cadell Evans Express, but you've got the whole of the team with Look him. Look at that. White, yeah. got white jersey on the shoulders of TJ Van Garden. Yeah. He's an American with a Dutch-sounding name. Yes, this is a routine return. Peter Sagan is also here as well as they start to go back. Uh, Paul, just uh, while I was watching and listening to Tom Danson there, take us back a year. Boy, how the times have changed for the team, uh, Garmin Sharp, because they were winning the team race in the Tour last year. Uh, they were riding uh, out of the boots in the team time trial. There isn't one in the tour this year. Tyler Farrow was sprinting well. He won on this very day. And now they seem to have quite a few problems in the race, not due to necessarily to themselves. Well, bear in mind that they've just come off a victory in the Giro d'Italia, so they've actually had a very good, successful season. You, we're only talking uh, day four, stage four of the Tour de France. Uh, uh, everything can be changed around uh, once we get into the second and the third week, so I wouldn't discount them uh, straight away. I think they will start to ride well, and I have a feeling that uh, rider Hegedal is going to be a force to be reckoned with once we get up into the mountains. They, yes, I, I must admit that Tyler Farah has not been a great sprinter. We, uh, we saw him uh, last year. This year, he's really struggling to find his form but you can just have a little bit of luck in a race like this then all of a sudden you turn the tables around yep. well we're looking at blue skies today as we course along uh, the alabaster coastline and we'll gradually we'll swing inland towards Rouen today three riders uh, still with a big lead well that lead has come down very slightly as the peloton warm up to the long day Welcome back. We're now approaching the speed zone on to speed zone. <laughs> the feed zone. It could be a speed zone as well, Paul. 133 miles, a long day today, as the riders now go under the uh, banner, which announces they can snatch those little musettes. Now, what's in these musettes, Paul? Well, it depends on the weather conditions usually, but the most important thing is there's usually two bottles in there. Peter Sargon sitting at the back here. He's having a nice, relaxed day this afternoon. Lots <laughs> of discussions about his victory to Luke. So I have to say, I would uh, err on the side of enjoying them after all, but Phil, he's only 22 two years yeah. of age and it really does bring a bit of excitement and uh, enthusiasm to his victories absolutely a character he is and let's see that personality come out on the tour de france but i can understand robbie hunter saying what he said earlier about uh, not too sure he should look at his rivals and do his little jig uh, but then robbie hunter was a little further back down that line i have to say the champion of south africa who is also a friend of ours by the way so we can talk about him like that anyway we're looking here now and this is the church of uh, saint leonard which was uh, consecrated in 1252 and the old bell tower is uh, a cross topped by a pelican if you've got good eyesight yeah but the amazing thing is that the old bell, the bell tower in the middle there was the original one which was built in the 13th century and after that the sandstone building around it was added in the 16th century most of the climbs are behind us and as we get a chance here to see it we must always remember that this is uh, not very far away from the beaches of normandy mm -hmm. and it was here that there was some serious military operations in the 1940s and one or two of the, uh, the seaside towns here were completely devastated during the, the Second World War towards the end of the war when the debarquement the as they call it in France happened. Indeed they were and the British flag flying alongside the French flag and the Scottish flag at this particular memorial site here in uh, the area around Rouen. We're in the department of the Saint-Maritime uh, which we're in for most of the day today but we did start in the department of the Somme uh, also uh, in the First World War um, a terrible zone for the First World War battles. Those, uh, those uh, uh, guns you saw there actually were taken off a boat called Le Serron, which is an auxiliary patrol boat, which actually sank out here in the, uh, in the, first, in the Second World War in 1939. And the wreckage you can still see when the tide is low. Well, as we inch our way closer to those three breakaways, it looks we've had a change of guard at the front here. Uh, the rider on the right has just told the riders he's stopping for what we'll call a natural break and so don't go any faster while I'm not with you. Uh, the others are keeping the tempo from Team Lotto. That is the team of Andre Greipel. It was a 36% work rate for Radio Shack, but it's changing now. Uh, Orica Greenedge have had Sebastian Lang up here a lot uh, today and he's 
contributed 35% of the effort for the Olika Green Edge team. Well, again, I expect it to be a big bunch sprint town towards the end. This man here, number 88, uh, riding his 11th Tour de France, uh, David Moncoutier, a very strange rider, very enigmatic. He ha he's one of those riders who cannot ride at the front end of the main field. So whenever you look at races like we've watched the Tour de France for many, many years, you will often see him sitting at the back end of the main field. He pick one day out in the yeah. race handbook and say, right, today I'm going for the breakaway. And he gets into the move and it's been successful on two occasions at the Tour de France, but he's won four stages of the Vuelta a España and the King of the Mountains in that event four times as well. I would say he's making an early move in the King of the Mountains by this breakaway today because he must know with the experience of 11 Tours de France that breakaway is not going to survive to the finish. Little smile off Arashiro there as he continues in that breakaway as well. Well, now is your chance to build your very own elite cycling team for this most epic race of the year. It's the Discover Card Fantasy Cycling Challenge. Just go to nbcsport.com forward slash challenge to register now and select your team to compete for daily stage prizes and the grand prize, a Cervelo R5 or S5 bike. The Discover Card Fantasy Cycling Challenge is presented by Discover Card. It pays to switch, it pays to discover. All right, well, they'll carry on. The wind is blowing in off the channel today. That could make it hard for the finish. Oh, there's, there's been a crash on the road here. And Sir Rabo banged down on the right. This is at the back of the peloton. Well, there's another crash gone down now, oh, Phil. Everyone's getting very nervous because we're getting that little bit closer to the finish. Oh my goodness me, as they've gone round there, confusion range, and I start a rider on the floor. There's been a big crash towards the middle and back of the peloton. One or two riders left on the road. This is not good. Yet another crash. Can you believe this? Oh, there's a crash in the middle. A rider went down that broke the peloton. Welcome back to the Tour de France. Lovely to see the shadows on the road. It means the sun shining upstairs today and uh, beautiful calm waters here as we race along the edge of the channel which separates uh, France from Great Britain. And the breakaway has been out for most of the day today but it's hovering at six minutes ahead. The riders now licking their wounds after a few days of crashes. And yesterday, uh, there were a lot of crashes. Anyway, before the start this morning, uh, Jonathan Waters chatting with our Craig Hummer. Jonathan, a lot of comments were made after yesterday's stage. Carnage, not just on your team. Is it hard to regroup even at a, at, at a race like this when you know it's, it's part of what you have to do on your daily basis? Uh, you know, I mean, we've got an experienced team here. These guys have been through this before. Um, you know, it's never fun to have bad luck, but uh, at the same point in time, you know, you, you have to count your blessings in the Tour de France. I mean, our primary objective for the race has been to protect Ryder and uh, to get him onto the final podium in Paris, and that objective remains intact. So, you know, we're counting our blessings in that regard. The rest of the guys, you know, it's a little tough, and, you know, Tommy D is going to have a painful day today, but, um, but... You know, spirits are high. This, this team this team bounces back pretty fast. We, we've been through a lot over the years. Being a former rider yourself, you've been through this exact sort of thing, but I know you care so much about these guys and you've put so much into this team. Personally, how much do you just cringe when you see a day like yesterday happen? Yeah, I mean, it's hard. You know, you... Uh I mean, as soon as you hear, you know, your your rider's number starting getting announced over the radio, and there's a crash, you know, you don't know if it's a broken leg or or just a skinned knee, and and um, yeah, I mean, it's always tough because um, I mean, gosh, I can remember back, you know, when the team first started, and you know, we way back then we had a guy in Tour of Georgia, Craig Lewis, that got hit by a car, and you know, we had a couple guys that have almost you know almost passed away and uh you know making those phone calls to you know to parents and to you know and and um to their wives and girlfriends it's uh yeah it's it's it's, it's never any fun i mean it's you know cycling it's it's the hardest and most dangerous sport in the world and people don't always appreciate it that that's the fact but you know it, it is you know i mean these guys are they're gladiators when people ask me about you and, and, and something quickly to describe you, I, I, I call you the, the Phil Jackson of cycling. I think you take a very zen approach to how, how you motivate your guys. Do you even need to do that after a day like yesterday going into a day like today where 
Ryder, of course, you keep protected, but also a possible chance for Tyler? You know, the, the key is that you keep it lighthearted. And, um, you know, the guys, they realize, you know, how the crashes happened and where they could have, you know, done something different. They're smart, you know. Um, I, I, I only select very intelligent athletes to be on this team. So, you know, it's it, the key is for me to basically just keep them focused on the next day. I mean, last year we had guys going down in the crash the day before the team time trial, and, you know, we bounced right back to win that team time trial. So it's, I mean, honestly, the best thing that I found you can do is basically just make sure everyone is smiling. Mm -hmm. And if you can do, if you can get a smile on their face, then usually the rest falls in place pretty fast. Well, thanks very much indeed, uh, Craig, coming there with Jonathan Walters. That was before the start today. Now he's in the team car behind the riders. Looking at Sebastian Langeville just passing through camera. This is Yaroslav Popovich. They're all looking pretty happy. This is Adam Hansen. He's smiling because the sun's out. He's from Queensland in Australia, where it's always lovely and sunny. I'm not sure whether this is going in or coming out. I should have said that, Paul, but well, he's decided to take it out. Uh, the Lotto team are on the lunch break at the moment. They're just keeping this breakaway. It's come down steadily. It's inside uh, six minutes to go now at the moment. But talking about the crash that we saw yesterday, uh, we saw what was a, a horrible crash by Simon Gerrans. He went literally over the handlebars and slammed into a barbed wire fence. And we had all the visions again of what we saw last year with Johnny Hoogaland. And yet he said his arm was trapped in the barbed wire till the next rider hit the fence and that rattled it out he said he looked like he'd been uh, attacked by a wild cat it's a it's a horrible thing to crash into something like that but the first few days of the tour de france are always very nervous and uh, there are lots of accidents once we get into day five six and seven things tend to calm down a fraction the thing is there's a lot of riders that are prepared to take risks to move themselves up in the overall standings and to move up in the peloton well, there's a little uh, cruiser coming in out of the channel, which is beautiful today. Absolutely smooth waters. As, he's as he goes round the back and out of sight, let me remind you what's coming up. The London Olympics are coming to NBC and the NBC Sports Network. Coverage begins July 25th on the NBC Sports Network, leading up to the opening ceremony July 27th on NBC. The big games are literally just around the corner. So, the lovely alabaster coastline with its uh, chalk and flint. We'll take a break and uh, we'll stay with the blue skies, I hope, today, all the way to Rouen. Still a long way to go. Welcome back. Uh, refreshing sight, I would think, for the riders because today is actually warm on the Tour de France and the sun is out as the riders continue to cross the beautiful towns here as we shortly we'll turn inland once we get to Fécamp and head down towards the finish in Rouen. Uh, we're not far away from where the River Seine, which goes through Paris, uh, goes into the ocean here, or the Manche, at uh, Le Havre. All right, well... Uh, our reporters were very busy before the start today, and now we can join Steve Perino as he chats with George Hincapi. George, you've been at this longer than anyone. If you look at your rivals and Wiggins, they're down one guy. How do you imagine that reaction is going right now? Well, you know, it's. I'm sure they're trying to not let it get get them down. Obviously, we're happy. We still have everybody. The first week of the tour is just so stressful and dangerous. Um, it's really important to always stay together and. You know, do that little bit of extra work to keep our guy out of the wind and out of trouble. So, so far things are going well for us and uh, hopefully it continues that way. Have you been in a situation where you're one man down and again, you know, sometimes it takes an outsider's perspective to understand what's going on with some other guys? Yeah, we've been in that situation uh, before and it's not, it's not a good thing for sure. Um, but, you know, everything's still possible even with eight guys, seven guys. Um, you know, so it's not like uh, they lost the tour yesterday by any means. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely right, George. Uh, George, the most experienced man in the Tour de France. He's done it more times than anybody else now because this year he's competing in his 17th Tour de France and the previous record was 16. But it takes a motorbike to keep up with the riders in the Tour de France on a normal day, that's for sure. And the crowd in this area, we don't come around this part of the Tour, of the tour route very often in France. Uh, we go to Rouen, we've been there 20 times by the time we get there today, but this particular route along the coastline is not one that we see a lot of with the rise of the tour. The crowd appreciating that. 
So the breakaway is three riders up front and Fabian Cancellara is the leader of the tour. He settles down at the head of the peloton as we wander along the Alabasta coastline as well. This is part of the nuclear power plant here. It puts out uh, 1,300 megawatts. It was built, it took 10 years to build from 1977 to 1986. The only thing that concerns me a fraction is they use water from the uh, English Channel for cooling down those four reactors. Well, they'll put the water back in once they've got it nice and warm, I'm sure. As, uh, as we continue the peloton themselves uh, seeing all of the views today because the, the way the race route is come right down the coastline today on the, what is the large part of the whole department of the uh, Seine Maritime the coastline's about uh, 70 or 80 miles long 120 kilometers long what a beautiful coastline it is uh, very dramatic and the sea is looking a wonderful color this afternoon as these three riders here are enjoying their day at the front of the Tour de France in so 6 minutes and 15 seconds We've got all of the climb, well, three of the major climbs behind us, but it'll still be a little bit of a lumpy ride once we turn inland and start to head down towards the finishing line in Rouen. Yeah, we, we are riding three or four hundred feet above sea level at some points, but it's uh, definitely a day for the sprinters. But Arishiro himself is actually quite a good sprinter, the rider here in green, with his ten victories over his year, only one ever in Europe itself, a small race. He's setting the pace. So they're just looking down now. We can't see the leaders up front because the gap at 6.17 is still uh, too far ahead of the peloton. There's a few motorbikes trying to get past the peloton at the moment too, wasn't there? That's what you should be doing. Sales not necessary today. Yes, welcome back. We're just in Saint-Sylvain for the tour riders now, which are still chugging along some six minutes behind those three breakaway riders. But so far, you know, we've seen a pretty interesting Tour de France, I think, this year. Let's remind ourselves how it's gone. This man's having a great Tour de France in Boulder, Colorado. TJ Van Garden back at the start in Liège. He launched out of that start house and he did the ride of his life. He is still the wearer of the white jersey. He finished fourth in the prologue time trial. The man who's come as everybody's favourite uh, is Bradley Wiggins, the first UK rider ever to come to a Tour de France as a favourite to win it. He launched out of the start house. We expected something special uh, from Bradley Wiggins. He rides the time trial very quickly. When he arrived at the finish, it was best time. It wasn't to stay that way, though. Seven seconds he would lose in the end to uh, Fabian Cancellara. And so Cadell Evans is the last man to go out of that start house. Uh, Cadell Evans, the winner of the Tour de France, first Australian to do so last year. He's up for it again this year. Did a good time trial, but he conceded time uh, to Wiggins, which is not what he wanted to do. And Fabian Cancellara, he started and it delivered the goods. Now, it's only two months since he broke his collarbone in four places in the Tour de Flanders, and he's back. He's got a large pin right through his collarbone. It's a perfect fix, though, as he'll tell you, and he got the win. The fifth time he's won the first day time trial in a Tour de France. Claimant of the first, Mayo Jorn. So, on we went to see how fabulous Cancellara would get on on the road between Liège and nearby Seran, but the way they went it's 123 miles and this man in his first tour, Peter Sagan announced his arrival with an incredible sprint win up a very difficult hill so Peter Sagan wins in uh, Seran, onwards for stage 2 the sprinters are at it again and Mark Cavani is proving as world champion the roads are flat, there's nobody can get near him in a sprint finish, beating uh, Greipel on the left and Goss on the right. The world champion strikes. Stage three, we're going to remember it more for the crashes than the racing, I think, because towards uh, mid-race, they started falling off, and uh, they weren't uh, just occasional traditional crashes we see. These were serious. Uh, Konstantin Sifsov, actually, when he was taken to hospital, had a broken a leg. Simon Gerrans ramming into the barbed wire fence over there. He said this morning he thought he'd been scratched by a wild cat. Rockhass, having his shoulder looked at, confirmed later he had broken his left collarbone out of the tour. A crash right on the finishing line, almost, anyway here. Bradley Wiggins was delayed, nobody was injured. They all were given the same time, which was one second behind the fast-finishing Peter Saga, who does his little dance for us, and we can't wait to see him win again, see what he does next time. An amazing man in his first Tour de France. He's now had two wins out of three possibilities. 
So to today, who's going to win today? We believe it will be the sprinters, and let's have a look how they've gone out onto the course today. In fact, at the end of it, no change amongst the leaders at all since that prologue time trial. Cancellara beat Wiggins there, he stays second. Chavanel, the Frenchman, third, almost won yesterday. TJ Van Garden sitting pretty in his white jersey and in fourth place. Eddie Boysenhagen in fifth. Dennis Menchov, the Russian rider, uh, menacing, I think, in sixth place. Cadell Evans, the defending champion, is seventh. And Ryder Hegedal, the Canadian who won the Tour of Italy this year, the first Canadian to do so, is ninth in this Tour de France. It's about as far back as we'll ever see Fabian Cancellara, I think, in the yellow jersey there, Paul. Yeah, just behind him, George Hincapie, 39 years of age, just the day before the Tour de France started, participating in his 17th edition of the Tour de France. I find that quite amazing. Yes, and uh, he's the... Uh, He's looking after Cadell Evans, that's his job here with his experience, he knows exactly where to keep Cadell and in fact Cadell Evans saying today he's thoroughly delighted with the way the team is riding for him at the moment. The artisans at work as we head down the uh, department of the Seine Battle Team. These are the leaders, this is the Japanese front runner, looking very cool and collected, a very popular young man here in France, he races for the French Europe car team. All of his big victories have come in Asia. He's been the Asian road racing champion as well. Uh, one day he's going to get a big win in a race like the Tour de France because he's a good sprinter, isn't he? Well, Phil, I'll tell you one thing, an interesting fact about him is he actually, in 2010, he finished ninth in the World Road Racing Championships. Yes, and he's only 22 years away. He's 27 now and uh, five foot seven. A small sprinter, Ishigaki in Japan is where he was born. But he spends most of his time living here in France now. So as we look at the two leaders, there are three, we're just off to the right of our picture is the young Japanese rider, there he is. So they're still making progress, that man is edging up the king of the mountains, David Moncucci. Don't forget, Sunday, July 22nd, the IZOD IndyCar series continues on the NBC Sports Network. Will Power looks to defend last year's win from the streets of Edmonton in Alberta, Canada. It's the 2012 Edmonton Indy, Sunday, July 22nd on the NBC Sports Network. So the gap now just under six and a half minutes uh, to those three riders so they've locked in for the moment David Moncuche will want any more points available and there are a couple on the small hills today as we head towards Rouen. Here we are following the shoulders of the English Channel as we run down the side heading towards Fécon which is then where we turn left and we follow the D926 uh, all the way down towards Rouen today and uh, well the French have been at it again they always find something new and that is a terrific little uh, scenery and I think it's the local farmers yes it is the agricultural people of the Seine and uh, uh, Maritime uh, wishing the uh, Bringing a smile uh, to everybody on their plates. <laughs> that worked. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, while they continue to entertain our man in the helicopter and us, of course, uh, let's have a look at uh, the Benedictine Palace. It represents a blend of extravagance and tradition. The 19th century building serves as both a museum and a distillery. Housed inside its neo-Gothic and neo-Renaissance rooms are 15th and 16th century religious artefacts and the gallery of modern art. Also on the facility is a distillery of the Benedictine liquor. The exact recipe and process of distilling remains to this day a secret, but it's known consists of 27 different herbs and spices which are all grown on the premises. So back with the peloton now as they continue to turn the pressure a little bit more, I think. Well, we're back in the narrow roads, Paul. We don't want to uh, mention it to the, the riders, but they've probably noticed it. On the far right, just peeping in in that light blue jersey, there is Tony Martin. Note his left hand. It's in a plastic cast after he broke his uh, scaphoid two days ago. 
from a 62. You might have just caught a glimpse there of Tommy Danielson. Uh, he's another rider trying to nurse his way through the uh, early part of this race because he had a dislocated shoulder yesterday and they managed to finish the stage. He was supposed to be plan B for Garmin Shah because he was the man who finished eighth in the Tour de France last year and he was supposed to be, if anything happens to rider Hazardal, he was supposed to be the man to take over. Now he uh, lost too much time yesterday, but he still wants to stay in the race because, as he said himself, Phil, when you come to the Tour de France, you've spent your whole year training and preparing for this event. You don't want to abandon, you want to get through. It's kind of becoming the waiting room at the back here for the injured because we've got Tony Dam Danson with his uh, separated shoulder. We've got uh, also Luis Leon Sanchez, who's also got a broken wrist there at the back. He's number 155. And, of course, uh, Tony Martin. So... They just ride along at the back of the peloton, hoping they'll avoid everything that happens today. And the thing is, Phil, uh, to make it a little bit more complicated, we've said to this since the very start of this season, it's a complicated year for a professional bike rider because you've got the Tour de France. One week after the Tour de France finishes in Paris, you've got to move across to London for the road race and the individual time trial. And guys like Tony Martin and Luis Leon Sanchez know they need the competition miles to go forward to the Olympic Games after this race. Where Martin normally would be the favourite to take gold in England. So, looking at David Moncoutier, without doubt the most experienced man in the breakaway, 25 wins uh, throughout his career, which began back in 1997. As we'll take another break here, the gap is just coming up to six minutes now, so the closing in. Back with the leaders in the Tour de France, a lovely undulations now, the scenery changing a little bit as we line up, we've still got uh, just on 60 miles left to race here, slightly less. Uh, three leaders out front today from five uh, mile point, 6.01, so it's virtually six minutes. They're just coming through, nipping seconds off at the moment. And the three leaders we've got are Yukia Arashio, the Japanese rider, David Moncoutier and Anthony Delaplace. So out in, uh, if the race were to end, by the way, right now, then we would have our first ever leader of the Tour de France. Uh, Arishio is the man who has gained the most time in the breakaway uh, so far, or lost the least time, if you like, to Fabian Cancellara. He'd be the leader now by 3 minutes and 57 seconds. And that would be a great piece of... Uh, but unfortunately, it doesn't end there, does it? No, it's a, it does end at the finishing so as we watch the peloton now uh, going uh, along, no wind indication there. We now have a great interview coming up. Before the start this morning, uh, the defending champion this race is Cadell Evans, and here's Steve Perino talking with him now. Cadell, as a team leader, you can certainly imagine the, the position that Wiggins is in. What are the challenges of a leader being one man down? Um, oh, certainly, um, you know, every, every man helps, and um, yeah... Yeah, you know, you'd rather be firing on eight cylinders than seven. That's uh, that's always the way. That's the way it goes, and that's part of part of racing the tour. You, Yesterday, TJ was uh, saying that you helped him keep his cool there in the final moments. Uh, who do you turn to days like today to get your zen? Um, um oh, to get my zen, uh, sit in the bus, <laughs> thinking about nothing. No, no, having jo George Hinkeby is really the the um, you know cool, calm, and collected guy of the whole peloton, and him being my main man, especially in the finals. There, it's um, yeah, all, all the reason to stay calm and concentrate on the task at hand. We well, certainly look cool now. Good luck to you. Okay, sorry. Yes, he Cadell Evans then ready for another day in the saddle. He's in the big peloton, of course, at the moment, which is now less than six minutes behind the leaders. As we just watched uh, the Lotto boys doing their first share of chasing now. This is uh, Francis de Greff on the front. And we've got uh, Radio Shack in second place. We've got Sebastian Langeveld of Orica Green Edge in third. Seems to be the teams uh, of Matthew Goss, which is Orica Green Edge, and Andre Greipel. No sign of Team Sky for Mark Cavendish. Well, they've, they've got a complicated uh, role to play here, Team Sky. Yeah, they've got the fastest man in the world, Mark Cavendish, yeah. uh, on their squad. Mm. But they've come here with a different goal this year, not to try and win as many, as many stages as possible for Mark Cavendish, but to try and win the bike race overall. So they can't waste too much energy. And on top of that, losing a man yesterday, Konstantin Sifsov, ma makes it even more complicated for them. And they've got to try and conserve as much energy as possible for the last week of the tour, if Wiggins is going to win this bike race. Mark Cavendish, of course, officially named today as part of the Olympic uh, road team, along with David Miller, the Scot who's riding this race, which he's particularly delighted about. And I'm delighted to say that the new national British champion, Ian Stannard, has also been put into the uh, Olympic team. 
It'll be a complicated Olympic Games though because it's not like the Tour de France where you can have a nine-man squad. Uh, only five riders participate in the Olympic Games and it's hard to control the main field so they'll have a hard job making sure that that's a peloton if Mark Cavendish is going to try and win himself gold. So as we wander around the chateau here in the area of the... Uh of the Maritime Centre. Let me remind you, the London Olympics are coming to NBC and the NBC Sports Network. Coverage begins July 25th on the NBC Sports Network, leading up to the opening ceremony, which are on July the 27th on NBC. We're looking here at the cliffs of Etata, which are, uh, as you can see, eaten away a little bit by the ocean, but they have made some amazing shapes out there in the English Channel. We'll take another break. The man who leads the green jersey competition, which is basically reserved for the sprinters, is Peter Sagan. He's had to, for two days now and he's had two stage wins as well. Cancellara passed it over to him, holds in second place. Mark Cavendish is third, Voisenhagen is fourth and Matthew Goss sits there in fifth place. They've all been actively involved in the sprints for the green jersey points. We're not too far away from Facon now, uh, just a few kilometres to go, about nine miles in distance uh, before they'll contest for that green jersey. This is Tony Martin who crashed two days ago and broke the scaffold in his left hand. He rides always now near the back of the peloton. Uh, every day he hopes he'll feel a little bit better, but he wants to stay in the race uh, because he's training for the time trial in the Olympic Games and he is the world champion of the time trial. So as we continue uh, down here, as the riders are not too concerned by the breakaway at the moment, the winner on this day a year ago, the 4th of July, was an American, Tyler Farrer, on the Garmin Sharp team. Before the start today, he spoke with Craig Hummer. Tyler Jonathan tweeted last night that he gave the team extra props for fighting back all day and specifically mentioned you. What would you do out there that, that warranted single single name status? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, everyone everyone was pretty committed. You know, yeah, everything fell apart for us at one point yesterday. So, you know, we all rallied and salvaged it as best we could. And, you know, I crashed and got back on. And then just as I got back on, Christian crashed. And uh, so I waited with him. And... You know, did what I could to try and help him at, at least minimize his time losses. So, you know, that's that's the first week of the tour that these things happen. And, uh, you know, luckily uh, most of us are, are relatively intact and, uh, you know, we can move forward. Last year you followed the movie script to perfection, winning on Independence Day. It's now a year later. Does a stat like that give you added motivation or being the pro that you are, does, does every day go out for a win? Uh, I mean... As an American, winning on the 4th of July yesterday was, was pretty special. So, you know, that's a, that's a good memory, and I certainly would love to, to repeat it this year. So I'll see what I can do. It's a tough spring core this year. You know it better than most. What did you learn from a couple days ago that you're going to apply to today? Um, you know, this, the first sprint uh, a couple days ago was, was quite chaotic in the finish, and, you know, I didn't do a good enough job uh, staying, out of the, staying out of the scrum. So, you know, hopefully uh, be a bit more in front with about a K to go this time around and, uh, you know, hope the legs are there. All right, good luck today. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Well, uh, the town where Tyler Farrow won on July the 4th last year was Redon. That's his only stage win so far in the Tour de France. Uh, but I'm sure he's such a good sprinter. If things fall into place, it could be another win for him at some stage this year. Maybe today, why not? Because we believe it is going to be a sprint finish today. First of all, though, they've got to close just on six minutes uh, to those three leaders. 90 kilometers or 56 miles uh, to go uh, to the finish. Uh, once we get to Facon, we start to go inland. Facon, by the way, sits on top of the highest cliffs on this beautiful alabaster coastline. And then the riders will turn inland, heading for Rouen. Well, in fact, it's uh, interesting that Facon is renowned for uh, the aromas and spices that go into the famous uh, Benedictine liqueur. Yes, indeed. Well, the herbs, I understand, are all in the garden, but they won't tell you how much they put in each. It's still a secret, Paul. 
<laughs> it still is a secret and a well-guarded secret at that and it's no secret though that Tony Martin is a very courageous bike rider yeah. 196 there he's got a broken scaphoid but he knows he's got to get through a number of stages of the Tour de France like this if he wishes to remain as a favorite to win the Olympic gold medal in the individual time trial and just sitting right at the back uh, at the moment is Marcel Kittel and the man that we uh, we really built up a couple of days ago to win the stage and then found him lingering off the back of the race and he was very very sick indeed he's hanging on just about as best he can at the moment it looks as though that was Vorganov of team Katusha with his hand up he's the champion the new champion indeed of Russia well it's uh, radio shouting for a change it's not Yaroslav Popovich on the front end of the peloton doing Good this pace, pace making looks like the shape of Tony Galopin has come forward now to help with uh, give Popovich a bit of a day off. Yes, it is as well. But alongside him, ever faithful second string there, in the second man in black, that's Jens Voigt. The sandwiched by in the middle is Sebastian Langeveld of Oliver Greenedge. Just a very routine. They're actually going exactly the same speed now as the three riders up front. They're neither gaining nor losing. They've got it locked in. Uh, they will keep it locked in like this for as long as possible. And then once we get a little bit closer to the finishing line, you'll start to see the teams of the sprinters take the pacemaking up in earnest. Just thinking here that we get a nice view there of the channel as they continue on. We're heading towards uh, Facon. Don't forget, we're not very far away. It's the green S. And as soon as we're th uh, through the sprint, we're on that small fourth category climb. So that's got uh, a recipe there for perhaps an attack or two uh, as they start to close in on those three risers. Once they get there, they're going to start to smell the finish. Their backs will then be against the English Channel as we're bound for Rouen today. We all understand the value of aerodynamics in a time trial, but those same principles exist out on the open road, especially if it's flat and fast like in a final field sprint. A large percentage of the athlete's power goes to overcome wind resistance. A big part of that wind resistance is an athlete's head. I'm here with Eric Richter, the brand manager for Giro. You guys come out with a really cool new product, an aerodynamic road helmet. Tell us about it. Yeah, that's right, Robbie. This is the new AeroTac helmet, something we're really, really excited about. And we think it's a huge benefit for the riders. As you said, wind is a huge part of what an athlete has to overcome every day. And the data that we learned in the wind tunnel allows this helmet to be really slippery without compromising performance like cooling that's critical to an athlete's performance. I was just going to talk about that cooling. A lot of times aerodynamic helmets are really hot. How would you guys combat that? The magic of this helmet is really inside. This fit system, called Rocklock Air, suspends the helmet about three millimeters off the rider's head. It creates a high pressure zone, takes air in, and with a Venturi effect, sucks the air over the rider's head, exhausting heat and stale air out the back. It works incredibly well. Now, I've heard that this aerodynamic advantage could be up to two bike lengths over the final 600 meters. That's right. As a rider's power and speed increases, the aerodynamic benefit increases exponentially. And we believe that over 40K, this helmet can save as much as 17 seconds on a flat stage. And in a situation like a sprint where power really goes up, the benefit becomes two bike lengths over 600 meters. That's incredible, guys. When you're talking about the stage finishes that are as close as maybe a foot, maybe even an inch, a couple of bike lengths, this helmet could be a game changer. Well, it's lovely to see the blue skies on today's route of the Tour de France. It's stage four today, day five, of course, because the first day is called the prologue and not a stage of the race. As we see uh, just one rider now from Orica Greenedge on the left, Sebastian Langeveld, doing his job as helping uh, Radio Shack set the pace. Now, uh, I, I recall many of you when I said, when you see the cow sitting down, it's a sign of rain. Well, it's the case in England, but many of you wrote and told me it's uh, when they s sit down in some countries, it's a sign of a very hot day. Well, it's working today anyway, because they're, they're all sitting down again and the sun is out. Three guys up front and still with a good lead. 6-19 the gap at the moment, Paul, and they were not very far away from Fécamp. Actually, we, we dropped down into the town off uh, what little height we have here above the cliffs. Yeah, we certainly do. Uh, these three riders will survive to get themselves points in the uh in green jersey points classification but what's more important, important more interesting is what's going to happen behind because i'm fairly certain we'll have a little practice from orica green edge trying to get some points for matty goss and also the lead out train they'll be challenging the lotto bellisol boys of andre greipel and in the mix there somewhere 
Mark Cavendish is going to have to try and uh, work out whether or not he wants to grab a few points to uh, get closer to Peter Sagan at the top of the leaderboard in that competition. Yes, it's, uh, that's a competition which will really develop, I think, and we're going to see a lot of people fighting out for this green jersey, I think, all the way to Paris this year. We're now in the town of Saint-Pierre en port and if you see the little church, it's called the Church of Saint-Pierre. Well, that figures, doesn't it? Fairly logical, I would have to say, yes. <laughs> There's the peloton a little bit further down, I think, than the preceding town. They're about uh, still six and a half minutes. They're actually nudging it out again now, 55 miles, just on 84 kilometers still to race. The riders, a lot of the riders hurting from the accidents yesterday, but only three uh, out of the race. Yeah, but uh, everyone will be very nervous because of those crashes of yesterday's, especially the guys who want to win this bike race overall. We've talked a lot about Bradley Wiggins and Cadell Evans as the two outstanding overall challenges for the victory this year, but there's a lot of guys behind who think they may well be able to create the surprise, and I wouldn't be surprised to see a good ride by Frank Schleck because he seems to be riding about the best that he's ridden all year. Having a little chat, two newcomers to the tour. At the back here, Jean-Marc Marino is on the right, and Julien Simon. Uh, those riders in their first Tour de France and just keeping well out of trouble at the back just for the moment at least. Narrow roads as we uh, wind our way through Normandy. We're looking, we shouldn't be too far away now from a 10 kilometre to go sign for that next sprint point of the day and Peter Sagan, he's got a massive lead. He's not, I don't think, got the high-end speed of the sprinters like Mark Cavendish and Greipel. He needs that little bit of a, a, an incline. We've got the majority of the, uh, the ripples behind us. We're well into two-thirds of the way into this bike race we're six miles away from the sprint point which is uh, just at the bottom of a nasty little climb called the Côte de Toussaint that's right once we're uh, into Fécond after the sprint is over we go on to this little climb and that's what David McCoutier in the red wants because he's moved up into second place now in this competition won three climbs today a point for each he's second behind Michael Morkov who's the lead with nine uh, Basso with two Peter Sagan with two and Ortizan has got one. Now yesterday we changed the name of Michael Morkov uh, because the Danish television advisors, but in fact Morkov himself says Morkov. So the peloton still happy with life at the moment. Stuart O'Grady having a smile on the left of our picture with Jens Voigt just behind Sebastian Langeveld. Routine so far, but believe me, it'll change. The 2012 Tour de France on the NBC Sports Network is presented by Radio Shack. Get the phone and plan that's right for you with key expert support at Radio Shack. By the Le Monde Revolution. Direct drive technology makes roller-based bike trainers obsolete. By Trek Bikes. Go to trekbikes.com to see the all-new Trek Madone. Fast is everything. And by Physique. The number one choice of the pro peloton. Visit physique.com to learn more. We're back with the Tour de France here. We're back at the peloton too. They're still they're losing time at the moment, approaching seven minutes. The time gap now between the peloton and the three front runners, which means that the three up front are going to contest at that green jersey point today. 20 for the winner, and that leaves 13 points for the winner from the peloton. That's a lot of points, so expect the big sprinters to dig deep in the sprint. Totally calm day, both weather-wise and cycling-wise, touch wood, so far today. But it wasn't that way on stage three yesterday. This is where Yanni Brakovic, in the middle of the bunch, he was knocked off his bike here by the man who's on his left shoulder in pink. There he goes, and there goes Yanni. And uh, fortunately, although he landed very, very heavily and he went to the doctor's car, He's OK and he's riding again today. Last year he crashed out with a broken collarbone. Further along the road, these narrow roads, uh, this was a little bit more serious for one rider because this is Constantine sits up. Mark Cavendish in the white uh, trying to struggle his bike out of the wreck there. But this was a sad side. This could be a big loss for Bradley Wiggins on Team Sky. This is the man who was to look after him in the mountains when the going gets tough. He's out with a broken tibia. Keep your eye on the right here, it's Simon Goins, who has gone through that fence there. The young Australian, and uh, he was planning on winning this stage, he told us this morning. Uh, to watch him go through and hit that wire. Thankfully, it wasn't as bad as uh, Johnny Hoogland's crash into barbed wire last year. But he said his hand was wrapped in the wire, and he was waiting for somebody else to hit the wire, so it would shake it out. 
Uh, this, unfortunately, is uh, Rockhass, Joachim Rockhass, broken left collarbone for him. He was out of the race at that point. And approaching the finish, another crash in sight of the line here. All of the riders in the race were getting the same time, which was placed one whole second as a bunch behind the day's winner, which, of course, was Peter Sagan. So there is no rush to get back on your bike, but, of course, you do have to cross the finishing line. And this is the uh, doctor's report here. Broken tibia sifts off, collarbone for Rockhouse, broken hip for Jangley. He finished the stage too before he found out. Separated shoulder for poor Tom Danielson. Slight concussion for Ertazan. Chest contusions for Caruso. A thumb for Kuhn de Court, the Dutchman. And a shin gash, rather nasty one, I have to say, for Philippe Gilbert. So there you are, you're all up to date. We can move out of the surgery and back into the peloton now. And here they are. And to me, from the helicopter, it looks as though they're picking up the tempo just a little bit. And that's why Jens Voigt has got control of the bunch just now. Voigt uh, on the front of the peloton, continuing the tempo riding. We're not far away from Fecon now. At least the leaders aren't far away. They're about two miles ahead, though, of uh, the main peloton. The Green Edge and Radio Shack are the two teams doing all of the work today at the front. Yes, but they're starting to see a change in the colours of the jerseys at the front end of this line of riders, Phil, because everyone now is starting to get a little bit nervous with that sprint point. As you mentioned, 13 points available. I just noticed that Bernie Eisler had moved up there with Mark Cavendish on his wheel, so he is being attentive. Yes, and he is looking for the sprint. That's for sure. Well, Cavendish won't miss out if he can avoid it as he makes his way. We're in the town of Fecon, a little way before the sprint point. We'll take a break. We'll be back for the sprint, of course. These are the three leaders as they head into Fecon. And we are now in the sprint. We're approaching the sprint point here in Fecon. 74 kilometers to go uh, to the finishing line. And uh, then we'll turn our backs on the channel and turn for Rouen as we go in a southeasterly direction to the finish today. Now, I think they might spin for this. If they don't, uh, I wouldn't be surprised because these boys aren't contenders in the green jersey, but there are 20 points at stake. And Arashio is a very, very good sprinter. And there it is, no sprint, so he's gone over the top uh, anyway. So the best sprinter won, even though he didn't sprint there. But now we are interesting in the main field here. They were looking at the... Uh, they move on to the fourth category climb now, where there's another point for Moncoutier, but the peloton, this we should see is a sprint royale. We're briefly back with the leaders, Paul, but talking on the peloton, we've seen Sagan scalp the riders on the strongman's finish up the two hills, uh, but he's not quite so good against the pure sprinters on the flat, is he yet? So, as I say, the sprinters are, are in the backpack and we expect to see Cavanish go, but can you think uh, Sagan is not quite that quick? Well, I'll get the question uh, away to you in a second, Paul. This is the now approaching the sprint point of 400 metres. That wasn't their flag earlier on as they continue through here. Nice little crowd in Fecon. We're at the point now where the race leaves the uh, channel and goes inland to Rouen straight after the sprint itself. And they also go on to a very small climb. Yep, the little climb of the Côte de Toussaint. Yeah, I think uh, coming back to Peter Sagan, Phil, he's a kind of, there are different kinds of sprinters. Uh, there are, you know, you've got guys who can do the 100 metres and guys who can do the 200 and 400 metres. Sagan needs a little bit of a climb, in that, I think, uh, to use his explosive acceleration. And that means that the sprint is not quite as fast as the real excessive speed of a man like Mark Cavendish or Matty Goss. Well, that was the main sprint point here in Fakon. It's the only race for the Green Jersey today. There's been no sprint amongst the three leaders. I think we expected that. Arashiro is the best sprinter here anyway. Uh, and he's got the line, gets 20 points. But there will very definitely be a very good sprint for the fourth place, which is worth 13 points to the winner. First 15 riders over the line in total get points. It'll be a battle. Mark Cavendish appears to be moving to the front of the peloton which indicates he's still taking an interest in this competition. He was the winner of it last year, the first British rider. Also moving up there is the green jersey holder of the day, and that is Peter Sagan, who's got two, uh, two stage wins to his uh, credit. Situation at the moment is Sagan leads the competition with 116 points. Cancelar is second with 74, and Mark Cavendish is third with 73 points. So. It's going to be important for these riders to try and get up there and get some more points. 
As I say, Paul, fourth place is worth 13 points. 13 points at 11 for fifth place, and uh, sixth place will earn you 10 points. If you cross the line in 15th place, you'll earn yourself a single point. But a single point at the end of three weeks could you win or lose you the competition. Look, uh, Mark Cavendish lost the points competition in this year's Tour of Italy on the last day by a single point, and he'd led it for a long, long way. Terrifically disheartening for him. Uh, but it, yes, every point literally counts. And uh, we'll see, uh, it's amazing, This I think it's a, a great innovation by the race organisation to have just the one sprint point with so many points available, puts a lot of pressures on the sprinters. In the past, when it was only six points available, they never even used to bother with the sprint point, but here, they take it extremely seriously. It's like a, a double stage finish now, so some of the big sprinters are happy when there is a small breakaway involving riders not interested in that competition, get clear. Pretty much what we've got at the moment now, because Moncucci there, now there's a problem at the back here. Uh, this is uh, Kreisvik, who's Kreisvik, newcomer, Stefan Kreisvik from the Netherlands, getting a back wheel change. First time Tour de France, he qualifies for the white jersey competition at the moment as well. It's not got in quite that easily, has it? In fact, no. the mechanic normally has it ready in uh, the quick release. It's normally set up in the back back seat of the car, so he can. but he's having a serious problem getting this done. Normally, you should change a wheel in around about uh, 14 seconds at the back, but this is probably the worst wheel change. I've seen the whole of this week. Oh dear. Well, there'll be a few Dutch swear words coming out in a moment. He's standing there very, very comfor confident, comfortable. But he's away now. There's still plenty of cars going by. Shouldn't be too bad. If it would have been about 10 miles to go to the finish today, he would have had a huge problem. Well, I tell you, that was about 38 seconds that uh, time for that wheel change there, but he won't panic. You see the rider wasn't panicking at all because he knows there's not much pressure on in the peloton. He can get quite in quite easily if he wants to. That was Bernie Eisel uh, briefly on the front there. He's obviously at the front of this pack because he'll be looking after Mark Cavendish. In fact, uh, Team Sky said this morning that they were going to get Bernie Eisel and Bosenhagen to look after Mark Cavendish at the intermediate sprint and the final sprint as well. We'll enjoy the view now because very shortly the riders will be going left and away from the channel. It's a beautiful day here in Fécamp as they continue towards the little climb which takes them away from this town. They climb up the cliffs, not literally, on the left-hand side as they leave town. The last climb of the day up the hill, uh, the Côte de Toussaint, and that will leave them then just 44 miles, uh, 71 kilometres to rest. Yeah, but you can see they've accelerated to get themselves uh, ready for the sprint, to put the sprinters in uh, the right position for this dash to the line. And you can see what effect this slight acceleration has had on the time gap. It was up as high as 7 minutes and 20 seconds about 4 kilometres ago. Now we've come back down to 6.5 minutes. We are in the town now of Facon. The peloton are heading up for the only sprint point of the day, apart from the finishing line itself. And this is very important. It's the race for only fourth place behind the three leaders. Uh, but Cavendish, Goss, Sagan, uh, and I suspect too, uh, the Rabobank uh, Renshaw will also have a go here and Greipel. Well, we get a quick look there. Though. We've talked about the Benedictine liqueur just a little bit earlier on. Well, that, in fact, is the Benedictine Palace down there, which was built back in 1882 and inaugurated in 1888. We're on the small climb leaving town here of Toussaint, and the man in red's won them all today so far. He's got three points. He's moved into second place in the King of the Mountains. He'll consolidate, but can't take the lead off uh, Michael Morkoff, the Danish leader, who's back in the bunch for the first time uh, on a road race stage this week. He's been in the break for most of them. And he heads up towards the top. We will swing back, of course, to see the sprint finish. It's unusual to get two major prizes being contested almost at the same time today. As we're seeing the three leaders heading up the last climb of the day. So, continuing on the climb here of uh, Toussaint. And I think uh, David Moncoutier will not be challenged. He will go through over the top of Anthony Delaplace once he sees the finishing line and put that point in the bag. Well, I'm not quite sure about the tackle oh, yeah, there because not. he hasn't even attempted to do that now. That's a surprise to me. Well, let's get back to the sprint anyway because here is the lead out as well and it's Orica Greenedger trying to do it now for Matthew Goss. But look at this, fourth man in the line, Paul, is Mark Cavendish. Right on his wheel in the orange jersey, that is Mark Renshaw. Now they're all moving up. There's Peter Sagan now trying to get himself onto the wheel of Mark Renshaw. He's not doing any argy-bargy at this point in time. They're just waiting now. Cavendish is locked onto the wheel of Matt Goss. Amazing to think that 12 months ago, Phil, he was the lead-out man for Mark Cavendish. Now he's got to try and figure out 
how can he beat him to the line? Well, he's launching, Goss has launched now, now can he make it? But Cavendish's going to come on him, and Renshaw trying to match Mark Cavendish now. Can Matthew Goss hold Cavendish on the line? It is going to be inch perfect for Mark Cavendish, and coming up on his left side in a rush was Peter Sagan, uh, but that wasn't quite quick enough. Cavendish, perfect timing here. Well, he didn't want to push it too much at this point, but he's just making sure that he gets his wheel across the line just ahead of Matthew Goss there and making a last dash, a last minute dash for the line there, the green jersey of Peter Sagan. He's proving he's almost as fast as these guys on the flat. Yes, he comes late too and he has to get round the orange jersey of Mark Renshaw, but Cavendish comes smoothly off the wheel of Goss. Goss knew it was Cav as he looked across at him and on the line probably uh, Sagan getting fourth I would think uh, we'll wait till we get the result officially I think Mark Renshaw Phil just got that third place with the lunge for the line he could see Sagan coming up so he just pops his wheel across in front of him so but Sagan is taking this series the funny thing is first second and third he turned the clock back a couple of years those guys were always on the same team well, if Mark Cavendish gets the stage win today he will also get the green jersey probably as race leader of the points but we'll see have another little look at that of course it depends on the final location of Peter Sagan in that sprint whether he would get the green jersey here we go this is the lead out and the second rider in the line is Matthew Goss followed by the world champion Mark Cavendish and then comes Mark Renshaw in the orange and Peter Sagan in the all green jersey and the other rider there is Alessandro Pataki but he didn't get up at all now the move waiting for the last possible moment before he comes out of the draft of the Australian sprinter Renshaw makes his move realizes it's not gonna work and almost sits up and almost lost third place there to Peter Sagan uh, we we'll wait for the official results but it looked to me as though it was indeed uh, Mon M. Sagan who got fourth in that sprint not fourth in the sprint overall because of course we don't forget we have three leaders taking the thick end of the points smiles from our cabinet here he's all a sprint is always happy when he's plying his trade successfully and now he's gone back into the peloton as they start the climb. It's only a short climb of the Côte de Toussaint. Back under the control of Yaroslav Popovic and Jens Voigt of Team Radio Shack, the teammates, of course, of Fabian Cancellara. There's confirmation how the points went. Yarashiro, 20 points. Uh, Delaplace, Moncoutier. Cavendish gets 13, scores a few points over Peter Sagan. Goss, 11. Pretty sure that Renshaw was the next place on the list. And now updated standings show us that Sagan has got 125 against uh, Cavendish's 86. So in fact, uh, I think Sagan won't be passed today when he gets to the finishing line. Cancellara is third. He's not really contesting. Boysenhagen wasn't there. He's in fourth. And Matthew Goss still there in fifth, but only a point now uh, behind Edouard Boysenhagen on Team Sky and Cavendish's teammate. So the peloton, uh, they're just about to come over the top of the Côte de Toussaint and surprisingly Moncoutier didn't get the point on that climb Delaplace did all that's left now is the big finish and we're getting closer we'll take a break the sprinters are licking their lips tomorrow morning the Tour de France continues on the NBC Sports Network at 8 Eastern and it's a good long flat day again tomorrow going through to Saint-Quentin. Tune in nightly as well at 8 Eastern for Tour de France primetime on the NBC Sports Network. So the Tour de France uh, continues on now. Now they've got to get on with the job of bringing back these three breakaways. Uh, they took almost a minute off them when they were involved in that sprint finish. The sprinters almost a dress rehearsal, I think, for when they come down to the real finish today in Rouen itself. Well, that's a good cue, isn't it? Let's have a look at our Road ID Challenge fan predictions and see who you thought would win today's stage. Now, I'm interested to see how many's gone for Mark Cavendish. 33% of you. 19% for Peter Sagan, 6% for Cadell Evan, Evans, and 4% only, I'm surprised, for Tyler Farrer. Only 4% for the American, who won on this day in Redon a year ago. Don't forget, head over to roadid.com forward slash ride to make your prediction for tomorrow's stage winner and you'll be entered to win daily prizes and the possibility of a 2013 Trek Madone. All right, well, 33% say Mark Cavendish. He's shown us in that dress rehearsal there's a real possibility he can do it again. If he wins today, it'll be Mark's 22nd win in the history in the Tour de France, which puts him right alongside 
uh, the top sprinter Andre Darragard and a certain Lance Armstrong. Smile, please, for the camera. This is uh, Arashiro of the Europe car team, sitting at the back, getting ready. He's still got a good lead, but he knows uh, with his experience that it's still a long way to go to hold off the riders. De La Place was in the day two breakaway on stage one, the rider in white. And David Moncoutier, we've just seen him for the first time in this race. Well, today we have a camera in the Orica Green Edge car today. Now, this might be interesting because they're the team of Matthew Goss. Let's have a listen in. Matthew White. Boys, we stay on the same road, the same direction for 30 kilometres. Same road, same direction for 30 kilometres. Make sure, make sure you hit guys. Good work in the lead-out, guys. Because he got rolled by Cab, but it was a good lead-out. Yeah, so he's, he's actually telling the riders now for the next uh, 19 miles they've got the same road in the same direction and uh, that means the wind is reasonably helpful so it's not going to cause any problems. He says, yeah, we got rolled by Cav in the sprint but they think, uh, he says, you did everything right so you can only try again and do it right at the finish this time for Matthew Goss. Uh, life on the back of a motorbike, I think that's the only job I would not want in the Tour de France, Paul. Uh, sitting on the back of a motorbike, sometimes in atrocious weather and very dangerous conditions. Yep, but uh, they do get uh, the best of side view of the race, that's mm. for sure. As uh, there's a lot of action going on at the back end of the peloton here. And once more, slipping back to uh, go and take on board drinks, Bernie Eisel. Well, he'll take on the drinks and he'll take them back up to his teammates, which include Bradley Wiggins and Mark Cavendish. He's gone back as the water carrier. And <laughs> this rider here also doing the same thing as well. And that was uh, Bert Grabsch, the former world time trial champion. Big strong boy from Germany uh, on this, uh, this squad. Levi Leipheim has had a fairly quiet uh, couple of days as well. And he's uh, sitting in the main field. He's hoping to be the, the leader of that squad once they start to climb up into the big mountains. He's currently lying in 37th place overall at 45 seconds. But it is all very much, Phil, at the moment, just about seconds in this bike race. A little bit of moisture in those clouds as we start to come away from the coast. Uh, but hopefully it will stay up. It's nice and sunny in Rouen at the moment and extremely warm. And a big crowd here as well and has been all day since the Tour de France started setting up shop. Uh, and it's a good sprint too, it's a perfect sprint for the sprinters coming in today. Well, I think it's an ideal sprint at, uh, over the last six kilometres. There not, there's not too much traffic furniture. Somehow they managed to find a fairly safe run into the city here once they come into the, uh, over the climb of the Côte de Cantaloupe, which is a small climb at five kilometres to go, but I don't think that climb at the end, Phil, will be uh, too much of a problem for the sprinters because it's a bit of a rolling climb. And uh, if you're a sprinter like Mark Cavendish, what you want to try and do is start the, the uh, climb at the front end of the main field. People have always said Mark Cavendish can't climb, but you know, the funny thing is he won a race called Milan San Remo, which has got a five kilometer climb down towards the end called the Poggio. And a couple of years ago into Obanya, we saw him get over a very difficult third category climb on the running toward the finish. And he had his team uh, lead him out and he got a great stage, stage victory, which nobody would have predicted. Well, uh, the contours often are exaggerated because they're concertina, of course. That's only actually 280 feet above sea level and they finished today at 50 feet above sea level or right on the banks of the river so I'm not too sure how they worked that out as, uh, as the race now beginning to lift its pace 5.45 there's Ryder Hegedal the Canadian the first Canadian ever to win the Tour of Italy and uh, Ryder Hegedal now just uh, biding his time and he's got a very good position overall he pulled off a great prologue time trial and he'll be happy too when we get to the mountains and uh, well let's just wait Saturday we have a first serious mountain finish up to a ski station and maybe rider Hazardal will show us just what a great bike rider he is Tour de France goes on towards Rouen All started with these three riders breaking away today and getting clear very early on. Then uh, David Moncoutier took three climbs out on the course while the green jersey points went to Arishir Fécamp, 74 kilometers left to ride. 
the gap at the moment, as you can see, five minutes and three seconds. But uh, I guess the big warning bells for Mark Cavendish took out the best of the rest there as they came in uh, to Fecon. Yeah, well, I think the important thing to note, Phil, is uh, the gap is now starting to plummet. At 70 kilometres to go, it was six minutes. Now, just after 10 kilometres past, now with 60 kilometres to go, it's down to five minutes. Mm. They've got it pretty much sorted out, the paint peloton. Well, they've got teammates willing to work, and that's the big thing. And uh, now you can see the line beginning to stretch at the front. The chase has had to be started sooner or later. And I was beginning to think they were not putting the pressure on quick enough with only 60 kilometres, 38 miles to go. Yeah, I think they want to pull these guys in and get themselves sorted out, but there's been a little bit of a dress wrestle for uh, Orica Greenage. But what I did think was interesting, Phil, is the riders from Belgium, uh, Lotto Belisol, they didn't do anything at all at the intermediate sprint point. So maybe Andre Greipel is ah. banking everything on the final sprint of the day. Yes, well noted that, Paul. I forgot all about Andre Greipel in that sprint. He wasn't there at all. You're absolutely right. Uh, that could be the big German uh, is trying for the sprint today. A little bit cloudy, but uh, it's okay. The winds, uh, nothing could... Uh, the thing was, had it been blowing usually as it does off the channel, uh, this race would have been in tatters after, uh, after the time we got uh, through Fecon. Average speed of the peloton today, uh, pretty slow by Tour de France standards, 23 miles an hour. Uh, and they're actually running uh, quite a way behind the expected time of arrival in Rouen. They'll pick some of that up, uh, but they won't get it back on absolute timings today. But what normally happens, uh, if we do have a slow start to the day, as we've seen this afternoon, uh, they do speed up very dramatically on the run in towards the finish. And although we've seen that average speed of uh, 23 miles an hour, 37 kilometers an hour, you will see the last hour of racing fill close to 31 to 35 miles an hour as they charge into Rouen at high speed. Now, we caught a glimpse of number 211 a bit earlier, Paul, uh, Marcel Kittel, and uh, I'm hearing from Race Radio that, in fact, he didn't have anything to eat at all yesterday, and he's not feeling at all well today either. Well, it's a tough place to get sick, the Tour de France, because it's not exactly the, uh, the ideal place to uh, get some rest and recovery, especially when you've got to throw 200 kilometres into your body every day. That's 125 miles of racing, and it's... Uh, it's a hard thing. Any, any small illness or any small cut at the Tour de France that happens tends to get exaggerated more than it does for normal people. But it certainly looks as though Oli could be able to do it. They're playing their part and they're hoping that Goss can get it right this time around. I'm sure that the boys in white, FDJ, are working for Hutrovic, the Belarus champion. He can pack a sprint and he has won this year in a sprint. The gap at 439 oh, they'll need to pick this pace up. They're trying to just draw them back in without making a huge effort, but sooner or later they're going to have to make the effort. As we go through the small town here of uh, Ypreville, uh, Biville, this is the church of uh, Saint Michel. It's a 17th century bell tower and it has a Gothic nave. And the just riders the won't notice that, will they? Not at all, as they uh, charge by there, the church of uh, Saint Michel over on their left hand shoulders. For them, what they're concerned about is the four and a half minute gap to the three leaders who've been away at the front of this race now for something like 155 kilometers. A long breakaway, so far breakaways haven't succeeded. I thought the best chance would have been yesterday with that series of hills near the end, but there were so many crashes disrupted in the peloton that they, they just turned on the pressure and quickly wiped out uh, the last of the breakaways. Andre Grifko, who by the way, finished quite a way behind after they caught him on the last climb of the day before the finish line. FD Day now going through. Uh, back up with the leaders just for the moment. This is Anthony Delaplace. It's his second Tour de France. David Moncoutier in the red. It's his 11th Tour de France. And Arashiro is on his third Tour de France. Now, the 2012 Le Tour Challenge, powered by Map My Ride and NBC Sports, is your opportunity to compete against cyclists from around the world during the Tour, virtually, of course. Get out and ride. Submit your ride to mapmyride.com slash tdf and compete to win the leader jerseys, just like here in the Tour. Each ride also counts towards $55,000 in random prize drawings. Sign up today at mapmyride.com slash tdf. Now this uh, is uh, Edward Boysenhagen dropping to the back here and he may have a problem with his crash helmet, he's going to have to change it, maybe the strap has, uh, has broken, looks like it is, they've given him another one, 
Alan Piper, no, Sean Yates it was, passing it out there, Sean Yates in the car. A little bit of advice for the youngster here. He really wants the white jersey of TJ Van Gaard and he's only one second behind him overall. So uh, he'll see if he gets up in the sprint today. He usually has a go at the sprint. Uh, I think today may look to help Mark Cavendish. Mark hasn't got too many friends in the race this year. He's got no big team around him. Because they're all working for his team leader, Bradley Wiggins. Vive le Tour, 2012 by the the people here of the village of Ypreville, Belpiville. Philippe Gilbert now coming back, uh, has a very nasty gash uh, down his shin from the fall yesterday. We saw him also having to repair his shoes on the run. Cost him a lot of time. And he's come back for a drink. That was his team director, Jean Laurent, just having a little word with him new team for him this year that's what happened to his leg uh, look away if you're of nervous disposition because he really did get a nasty gash down that shin uh, yesterday and it took him a while he didn't get back to the race he did lose time uh, that in itself is not too serious he's here once the race gets into the second week to try and help Cadell Evans as well new team for Gilbert last year he won 24 races had the sort of season every professional cycle dreams for Gilbert is Belgian, but he speaks both languages, though. He comes from the French region. He speaks Flemish as well. That's French, which is unusual in Belgium for speaking both languages. Now he's going back up. He's uh, loaded up nicely. Everybody's still getting on with taking drinks from the cars. It's about time they got on with catching those three leaders. It's looking a little bit more concentrated at the front at the moment. The time, I think, will now start to come down. To keep up with the Tour de France, you'll need the most advanced digital experience of its kind. Go to nbcsports.com slash TDF Live and get Tour de France Live. For a limited time, get Tour de France Live for $29.99. Some people enjoying fishing here, just away from where the race is passing through now. The leaders are passing through quite a heavy rainstorm, while the main peloton are only feeling a few spots, but they'll probably catch it very shortly change and a rush to the front now of other riders trying to pick up the tempo the red jerseys of team katusha perhaps thinking of oscar Freire, the three times world champion to see if he can get up in the sprint today well change of countries change of scenery there paul as we continue on our way here the peloton now heading to the slightly damper roads just ahead yeah, that giraffe we saw just a few moments ago, Phil, I'm not sure whether it was a reticulated giraffe or a Rothschilds. <laughs> I'm sure it was reticulated. They're into the, another roundabout here. And interesting that uh, Katusha have now put quite a lot of men on the front here, which means that perhaps the thinking of uh, Oscar Ferrer today. Well, Oscar Ferrer was in the mix, and I think he was the man responsible for that crash yesterday. He's a very agile sprinter, and he tried to get through a gap mm. that I don't think was there, but once he got his shoulders into it, the gap appeared quite dramatically. Well, we're on, we're on the ripples, we'll drop off the high roads and down the valley and then we'll have that little climb just before the finish and then it's downhill and a flat finish on the keys here in Rouen. Not really, uh, not really the spin finish, I wouldn't have thought, for Oscar Freire. But here we are, the wet roads with the breakaway now and David Moncoutier in that red jersey. He's already a previous winner in the Tour de France, you know. He's won a couple of stages in the Tour de France. I remember back in 2004, he won in Figeac and uh, proud moments for him the colors of the team were different then but there's just the same now and then again in dean leban 2005 was much more important to him though because it was bastille day the 14th of july le 14 juillet a big day for the french it was their uh, their independence day if you like and for him he just is quite a remarkable guy 37 years of age yeah. uh, 5 foot 10 152 pounds and his strength it's all about climbing and probably the last time we will commentate on him this time because it's the end of his career after the Tour de France and the Tour of Spain and this is the 11th time in the Tour de France as well. 
I don't think he's got any chance of winning a stage today, though, has he? Because the peloton now, they're taking over at the front is the Russian team, Katusha. They're more interested now in bringing them back. They're all going to get very, very nervous now, Phil, because uh, the fact that this uh, little rain cloud storm has come down, it's wetting the roads, mm. and that's why we're starting to see a lot of movement as people try to move up to the front end of the field. It's a, a big dousing. Uh, it's amazing to, to think that the, the riders in the breakaway are getting a lot more rain on them than the men in the main field. Yes, and the tyres are pumped up very, very hard because the roads were originally dry and so was the forecast for dry roads. So these roads can become very glacial. Uh, obviously, there's a bit of rubber on them and stuff from the vehicles normally. So they've got to be careful when they go around these uh, roundabouts and traffic circles and, and take care. Yep, a little discussion uh, between uh, Yaroslav Popovich and the riders from Katusha. He shouldn't have any problem at all there because uh, Yaroslav Popovich, being from Ukraine, actually is fairly versant with Russian as well. He's complaining because they started to race. Uh, I wouldn't have thought that was good reason for complaint. No, not at all. Over on the left-hand side there is Bradley Wiggins. He's uh, riding behind his teammate. Christian Kinis seems to be the man who is actually uh, looking after Bradley Wiggins. Well, Popovich there, it's unusual to see him get annoyed with riders, isn't it? But he clearly there didn't want the Katusha riders to set the pace at all. He, they've just come up and they had a plan and they sort of said, forget it. Well, he's, he's, he was very upset about it when yeah. that happened, Phil, and I think he probably thought that they made a, a little bit of a dangerous move going into that traffic circle just as the rain was starting to come down on the, ra yeah, on the race. Yeah. Well, it's four minutes 40 now. It is coming down. Another second just snicked off there. Was, they were lucky they didn't get here a few minutes ago because it was quite a heavy storm, this. But it has blown away now. So Popovich then is showing the other side to his character. I don't think I've ever seen Popovich really uh, get so annoyed as that with riders. But he clearly was displeased by the Russian suddenly appearing. Well, let's not forget he's probably a little bit tired as well. I mean, ridden on the front for probably 80% of this race since we left Liège. Yeah, that's absolutely right. He's the dedicated early runner along with Jens Voigt by Radio Shack. And uh, very shortly they'll be able to take their tea break and go to the back. Yeah, but that's when this pace will start to lift up. And I would say now, as we start to see uh, 50 kilometers to go, we'll probably run that 50 kilometers off, Phil, in around about uh, one hour of racing. And uh, despite having a little bit of a uh, contretemps with some of his uh, Russian counterparts there, Yaroslav Popovich has gone straight back to the front of the peloton, and he's setting the pace again. Uh, well, we're looking here at the number 92, which is Anthony Delaplace in the Seyur Sejourn. And he's in his second Tour de France, that young man. And we saw him in the day two breakaway as well so he's been an aggressive rider this year Anthony well, Delaplache yep he's uh, as he continues carry on Paul yeah riding the second Tour de France he was in the breakaway on the the first uh, day of the Tour de France a six-man breakaway he's a uh, fairly tall bike rider too at five foot eleven but he's fairly light at 145 pounds he was born in Valogne in France and he's actually better suited as a climber than a long breakaway artist well, he's had two long breakaways, and uh, I, I can't say neither has been successful just yet, but I figure in the next half an hour, I will. Uh, last year, he was the youngest rider, I think, in the Tour de France last year. 4.18 is the gap. There's Cadell Evans, and uh, this man so far hasn't done anything wrong. He started the season off extremely well with a victory in the Criterium International in Corsica, in fact, where the Tour de France will start next year. He's come through with a Tour of Romandie, he's, got, he's done the Criterium du Dauphiné, and now he's getting himself ready to try and defend his title as the winner of the Tour de France last year. And his team are all over him, but what a nasty little cloudburst this is. This has really come down all of a sudden, so they didn't escape it, the peloton. It is now raining very, very heavily. It won't last very long, that's the only good news. And they'll come out of the cloud. And uh, they've got to watch these roads now. They're going to become a little bit glacial for a moment. They're very, very wet. Well, that's the worst thing about uh, having a, a bit of a hot spell, which they've had in this part of France. And all of a sudden, you get the first little bit of rain like this. And it makes the road much more slippery than if it had been raining for three or four days. Because if you've got that continuous rainfall, it actually clears away a lot of the oil. But here, the oil will still be mixing with the water, making it just a little bit slippery. Well, let's see who's doing the work on the front now. We've got Francais de Gier in the white. Uh, Katusha have kept their men up there, despite what uh, Popovich was saying to them in the red. And also Orica Green Edge have got men up there as well. So Nissan have done most of the work to be expected, 51% today. Green Edge at 29%. Uh, Orica, Katusha, AG2R and Sky are all part with Sprinter's teams, on Sprinter's on them. Sky not really helping Mark Cavendish, only doing 3% of the work there. 
uh, and that's because it's, um, it's not their intention to help Mark on this year's Tour de France. Now, just uh, have a look at the back room of the surgery here today. There's three riders back at the race still. 155 is Luis Leon Sanchez. Just in front of him is Tony Martin. In front of him is Tom Danielson. All in pain today. Uh, parted shoulder yesterday in the crash for Tommy D. 62 there. The other two have got broken wrists as they make their way towards the finish. They will not be happy in the conditions now, but they're changing. We're back out onto dry roads now, and it's time to get on and try and win the Tour de France in a sprint finish. We're in the town of Alaville. Let's have a look then at our Cadillac Tour leaders at the start of the day. Fabian Cancellara, the only man yet to have worn this yellow jersey. Peter Sagan for two days now has been the leader in the points competition. Green, the king of the mountains, is still Mikhail Morkov and will be tonight. And TJ Van Garderen, the only wearer of the young rookie's white jersey. He sits in fourth place overall in the Tour de France. There's the peloton. As they're beginning to be stretched out by some high-speed riding now, we should see this clock descend quite quickly as Radio Shack and Team FDJ are all working very hard at the front. Well, Peter Sagan is the man. We've seen him push for points at the last sprint point in Fecon, and we'll see him push for the finish again today. He's won two stages already. So, Peter Sagan is our man for our Cannondale athlete profile. At just 22 years old, Slovakian rider Peter Sagan has already left an impressive mark on the world of cycling. Prior to coming to this year's tour, Sagan had already won 13 races, including a stunning five out of eight stages at this year's Amgen Tour of California. Peter Sagan, this guy is unbelievable. His string of early victories were stepping stones as he prepared for his first Tour de France. This is the man we've been waiting to see what he can do in his first appearance at the Tour de France. They come in here for maybe win uh, one stage and maybe two. And Sargon is coming clear to get his first stage win. That is unbelievable. And win number 14 of the season for him. A green jersey. Yeah, I hope, I, I try. I am very lucky now and uh, I want to hold on. Two stage wins in three days for a 22-year-old is really something very remarkable. What did the running arms mean today? Uh, today I was Forrest Gump. <laughs> <laughs> How many victory celebrations do you think you're going to need this Tour de France? Uh, I don't know. For me it's good on only two, but I won green jersey. The baby face killer is on top again. file of uh, developing a new personality a new character on the tour de france in peter sagan and there's some more information on peter sagan 22 years of age he stands six feet tall and we're going straight back to the race because these are live pictures that are crash here as well out on the highway and uh, this is the saxo banks jonathan cantwell here in his first race for australia on the saxo bank squad he seems okay just waiting for his bike to be sorted out And uh, just getting back, this is Mikel Charel, uh, who is also getting back on his bike. Again, Paul, as we get into the closing stages... Ah, the Nibali, Nibali number 51. Now, that is important, and he's not very happy about this at all, and he's got two teammates alongside him. He is one of the pre-racer challenges for the overall victory, a former winner of the Vuelta a España. He didn't look too happy with that, but that was all because, Phil, they were getting into that echelon at the front end, and the wind was coming from the side. Well, he's in the top ten overall at the moment in the Tour de France, and he's expecting the challenge in the mountains. He's finished th twice uh, third in the Giro d'Italia. He's won the Tour of Spain. And he's got two teammates uh, warranted alongside him, including Federico Canuti. We'll try and see what happened here as uh, they're coming around the sweeping right-hander, and I think it must happen in the centre left of our picture. There it is, top left of our picture, quite a long way down the peloton. It was Campbell who went down first there, the Australian was. rider from uh, Team Saxo Bank Tinkoff. 
And what, it, what happens, Phil, is when you're, when you're on the rivet, as they say in professional cycling, where you're under a little bit of pressure and the wind's coming from the left, you try and ride further and further over to the left-hand side to get some shelter from the wind. And what can happen is you pop off the road and then all of a sudden you try to get back up and the wheels just come from underneath you. Yeah, well, we've seen one or two riders forced out onto the grass while, while we've been commentating today, actually. These roads aren't wide enough at the moment for all of these riders. They've sorted themselves out. There's still riders chasing, and not least the number 51, Vincenzo Nibali, who uh, will want to get back to that peloton fairly quickly now because the bunch will be under pressure to chase down the breakaways. And this is why we always say you cannot win the Tour de France as an individual. You need a team to look after you. That's why these three riders here from Liquigas have sat up. They've waited for their team leader and they're pacing him back through the main field, the convoy of cars to get him back into the peloton. Been joined by a couple of Frenchmen on the Cofidis team here, including René Di Gregorio, number 82, and number 85 uh, is Julien Fouchard, another first-timer in the Tour de France. Well, up there, that's Christian Kaur and the Slovenian rider uh, for uh, Liquigas Canandel, who's uh, helping his teammate to get him back into the main field. He's number 54. The other rider in there as well, 53, is uh, Federico Canuti. They it doesn't look as if he's panicking at all. He didn't look happy to be slowed down by that crash, but he doesn't look like a man under pressure. He's currently lying in eighth place in the overall standings, and a lot of people see him as the dark horse for a victory in this year's tour. Well, this is uh, this is interesting. This because uh, now uh, uh, Nibali wants the team car of Cofidis to get through as well to try and uh, block a little bit of wind off him. I can tell you, if the referees spot this uh, blatant pacing, that they will receive penalties for sure. Well, first of all, they'll get a financial uh, penalty, and then after that, if they're deemed to have uh, stayed behind the car for too long, they could also get a penalty in time, and that is costly if you're trying to win this bike race overall. Interesting for an Italian not to ride the Giro d'Italia. It's the biggest thing mm -hmm. on the international calendar in Italy. But uh, Vincenzo Nibali, he said to himself, now I want to prepare for the Tour de France, I want to make sure I get it right this year. He's won the Vuelta a Spanish, so he went to the Amgen Tour of California, where he didn't really show uh, a great deal of uh, form. But all of a sudden, when he came to ride the prologue in Liège, he was on fire. He was, and that was what he intended it to be that way. And uh, I think he's been lying low and waiting for the first hills of this year's Tour de France, that's for sure. Another great job down there on what looks like a football field. This is the area of the saint a maritime Department of France. He's the three leader. We haven't forgotten about them. And they're still pretty much up front at 3 minutes 26 seconds, 27 seconds in the lead. Going, uh, coming off uh, the hills now, heading down uh, to flatter roads and still with a nice lead because we're running into the last 25 miles of the day, 40 kilometres. Well, in the last uh, 30 kilometres, they've taken two and a half minutes off the advantage of those riders, but I think we're going to start to see that tumble a lot quicker now, Phil, because they really are putting some serious pressure on the front end of this peloton. Well, can you believe this? It looks like we're back in rain here as uh, this is the group again. They've got to be very careful with these central islands as well. And looking up the road, they can see the tail of the convoy of cars now. So, And they've been joined by other riders as well, because tagged onto the back here is Bian, Biel Kadri. He's a member of the um, of the AG2R team, and he's trying to help back his team Oh, there's leader. a little bit of a move here coming from uh, Arashiro. Now, he's decided these guys haven't got the power to stay with him anymore, so he's going to make it a lone effort. Do you know what I saw? I looked at his face about five miles ago, and I was thinking to myself, he's tired. Well, <laughs> well there you go. He's uh, outfoxed the old fox himself, hasn't he? As he now <laughs> makes this move, and I'm not sure whether Moncoutier is going to take up the pacemaking here. He probably knows in the back of his mind that they're going to get caught towards the end of the day, and he will look for another breakaway later on in the Tour de France to try and get himself some points for his assault of the King of the Mountains classification. Well, he's not really resisting at the moment, we'll see. But now uh, Delaplace has decided he's got to try and bring it back and Moncoutier has taken his friend, the other Frenchman's back wheel. So the, the racing uh, back, an interesting move that pole and uh, did it going downhill I think because he went away straight away and uh, this is a good sign that he, we've had never had a Japanese stage win of the Tour de France. Why not start to get it today? But I'm not too sure because they're right up on him again now. Well, anyway, it's all back together and he went round that corner like uh, a man possessed as uh, he opened up that gap. But the better part of Valerie said, well, maybe I'd better stay in the contact with these guys because we've got more chance of surviving for just a little bit longer if there are still three pairs of very strong legs. Shaking out the effort of the attack. Gone back into third position there, Yukia Arashio. There's the peloton, still a big pack here nonetheless, and uh, I don't know yet if they're, well there's my answer, they haven't yet rejoined, but they're coming up quickly. 
Yeah, it takes a long time, especially uh, when the main field is going very, very fast indeed. And it looks like he's being left up to his own devices now, straight across that traffic circle. Nice bit of agility there, bit of concentration. You've got to be alert all of the time to make sure you can make a move like that. And to do that, you have to lift up your pedals and you can sail over the top of a, 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 a yeah. point like that. Over the central traffic furniture. Well, this is Nibali, who's the most important man left behind here at the moment. The other ride I was starting to tell you about, John Christoph Perrault is the AG2R team leader who is in this line as well. But now they're quickly moving back up towards the peloton with assistance here from his teammate, which is Sylvester Smith. Well, just check out the, uh, the way he's zigzagging left and right. He's looking for any possible <laughs> bit of slipstreaming from the motorbike, from the cars. He's using everything that he can. And as long as he does this and doesn't actually sort of slipstream yeah. for a full, for a long time, the referees will take another look. And it's a real, it's a very good piece of moving that he did. He gets into the yeah. back of the car, like if you're driving in a, an Indy car or if you're driving a Formula One racing car, you get into the slipstream and then you flick round. Well, he's got on and he, <laughs> Smith had a job keeping up with him. He didn't know which way he was going next there. The other rider on there at the back is Daniel Oss, 56. So as we continue now, we are running out of road for these riders. They're going to have to really slice into that lead. It's still three minutes and 17 seconds for the three riders. These are good racing roads now because they're narrow and they're twisty. So the leaders won't come into sight until they're almost caught. 22 miles now from the finish. But again, we've seen a situation that could change the yellow jersey's destiny. Vincenzo Nibali was the man in the biggest trouble here because he is a pre-race favourite. But he's safely back in the pack as he races towards the finish again. At the peloton now, they are absolutely screaming here as we race towards the Breton Bridge just ahead of the peloton over the river Seine but bound now of course for Rouen and the Pel peloton have decided time is time feel a little bit sorry at the moment for Tommy Danielson he is the third rider off the back of our picture in number 62 he's just got back on the tail of this peloton because moments ago this was number 62 Tommy D trying to get back up to the group the pressure has gone on remember he has a a separated shoulder and a great pain so as we get back up to the uh, peloton, we're more or less all together now. There is the beautiful bridge, the Broton Bridge. Let's go outside and upstairs and meet with the prime time crew. Liam, what's cooking for tonight? Well, Phil, it's 4th of July. We've got a little barbecue going on here. Three American guys talking about cycling, and we're talking about the intermediate sprint and how it's going to affect the field sprint down the stretch. Mark Cavendish doesn't seem to need teammates. What can some of these other teams, like Matthew Goss's team, Andre Greipel's team, learn to prevent it from winning this field sprint? You know, I think for today, they're probably going to just follow the plot that they have been for the last couple of days, but I think moving forward, these guys are going to get a little tired of taking Cavendish to the line, possibly getting beaten by him as he's done uh, in the past. So I think we're probably going to be looking some serious breakaways. There hasn't been a lot of pressure on Radio Shack at this point. Controlling a, a breakaway of three riders, five riders is really not that difficult. But if you get into the double digits, it's going to put a lot of pressure on Radio Shack. And also, Sky is probably not going to devote a lot of uh, matches to burn to bring Cavendish to the line. Also interesting to see that Greipel did not participate whatsoever in that intermediate sprint, saving himself everything for the end. None of even his teammates did any of the tempo. So watch for Greipel to uh, try to get the better of Mark Cavendish at the end of today's stage. Scott, do you still think Mark Cavendish takes down the field sprint at the end? Yes, I do. I do, actually. It looks uh, like a perfect perfect sprint for him. Uh, it's a couple of technical turns in the last kilometer or two, but it's a pretty straightforward run in. Um, yeah, I just, I think he's, he's kind of, he knows that his days are numbered, that it's not going to continue to follow this, this pattern, and there will be a time where they're just not going to be able to bring back the break, and he's not going to have the allies he does right now. So I think he's, he's going to take his shots when he can. That's bad news for Phil and Paul because that was Bob's pick in the predictions <laughs> this morning. Well, much more coming up on Tour de France primetime at 8 p.m. Eastern, and we will touch on the young American T.J. Van Garderen and his bright future. Plus, as always, it is Ask Bob's Bob Key presented by Head Sweats, all at 8 p.m. Eastern. Phil, Paul, back to you. Thanks a lot, Liam. Yes, tonight, 8 p.m., that's the time for our primetime show, and you'll probably be reporting Matt Goss as the winner, not, of course, uh, Mark Cavendish, but we'll find out, won't we, Bob? Hands gone up here at the back of the field. Uh, this is Christoph Kern. You remember him? He was in that big breakaway on the first road race stage of the Tour de France. The Abbey de Saint Wandril is uh, another beautiful abbey here, Paul. And these riders can't see any of these lovely monuments today. 
This abbey, in fact, uh, was founded in 649 when the first church was built on this site dedicated to Saint Etienne. And that was uh, uh, later on added to in the 1500s. But uh, it was uh, knocked down and rebuilt by the Huguenots in 1562. There we are, back with the leaders, they are still there and the kilometres are ticking off. We're now inside uh, 20 miles to go to the finish, 30 kilometres left, they haven't given up hope. The time is saying they're not going to make it, 2 minutes 40, but they've got to keep trying. They will continue to ride like this until they've got the main field right on their tails because they've been away since the first kilometre of this race and they will always hold on to a little bit of hope that the peloton makes a mistake. Two Frenchmen and a Japanese cyclist. The three there, the, the French flag is waving. This is David Miller here, who has been announced as part of the Olympic team for Great Britain today. As Miller now is uh, had his hand up, I think, there. He wants a little bit of advice or a drink, maybe. Yeah, I think he wants to uh, make sure he keeps the, the rest of his team looked after properly. His teammate, uh, Tom Danielson was involved in a nasty crash last night, finished their race with a dislocated shoulder. He's got it all strapped together. I would think this is probably getting up to the last point where you can go back to the team car and take on board drinks, and that's mm. probably what David Miller is doing. That's it. Um, and uh, David Miller was uh, tweeting today about Sargon, and, uh, you know, one rider, Robbie Hunter, he wasn't too keen on it because Robbie Hunter said on his Twitter site that... Uh, he can't say, he didn't say, I don't really enjoy the victory salute in the face of his competitor that Sargon is giving. But David Miller, I thought, came up, came up with a perfect answer. Miller said on his Twitter site, totally for Sargon, his crazy salute. He said he's 22, he's got plenty of time to grow old and dignified. He's absolutely right. Well, I think we need to show Robbie a couple of the uh, victory salutes <laughs> that have happened in the Tour de France in the past because uh, Robbie McEwen did that running man uh, a number of years ago. Robbie always yep. came up with some uh, great victory salutes on his way to winning 12 stages of the Tour de France. But they've both been uphill so far and he's won clearly from the pack if it comes down to a victory by him today you'll need to keep both hands on the handlebars I think because if he wins it won't be by very much no it'll be a very close sprint today it's a great finish for the sprinters there's a right hand and a left hand bend just as we come into the final kilometers they come over the bridge across the river Seine and then 900 meters straight as you like ideal for a sprinter especially if you get a proper lead out Yes, and that's the thing, Mark Cavendish hasn't got a proper lead-out team in this particular race, so he's going to have to use the other teams and do the best he can. Although when he won there two days ago, he didn't need anybody to help him, really. He read it perfectly right. There's the peloton. They still are closing in, but are they closing in quick enough? The arrowhead has formed now as they get the two lead three leaders in their sights. The 2012 Tour de France on the NBC Sports Network is presented by Proform TDF, the official training bike of the Tour de France. Visit Proform.com to see more. By American Classic, bicycle wheels engineered for speed. By Giro, the leader in performance and style that advance the ride. And introducing the runner by Clean Bottle, the only running holder with a special pocket for your iPod or smartphone. Available exclusively online at cleanbottle.com. We're back with the peloton here now, and they are really beginning to press on those pedals a lot harder than they were earlier. The face now of Jens Voigt, a lot more urgency about here now. And there's Bradley Wiggins also getting himself up to the front and hopefully away from these falls we seem to get in the closing miles every day. We're on the flatlands now, the on the right is the River Seine, that's where we're finished, along the banks of the River Seine. You can see on the profile there, just that little hill, which might be a springboard for somebody to have a go. Then we run straight down, back onto the River Seine. We cross over a bridge in the side, the last kilometre to go over the Seine itself. Seine, the same river that runs through Paris, it's 777 kilometres long, it's about 475 miles, something like that. So, heading up to the 25 kilometres to go, Banner now for the three leaders. They know that they're heading towards the flatlands and the final run into town. The little hill towards the end, Paul, there is a chance, but it might be the, 
it might be used to catch these riders rather than create the breakaway. Yeah, I think more it's what uh, we call in uh, professional cycling more of a roller than a climb as far mm. as I'm concerned. I think with the impetus and the speed that the main field is going to be charging into the outskirts of Rouen, I think the sprinters will probably get dragged across there by the slipstream with the rest of the peloton. Two minutes almost exactly now, which means that uh, Arishiro is no longer the virtual leader of the Tour de France for the first time. He started the day at two minutes and three seconds behind Fabian Cancellara. He's now exactly two minutes in front of him. There he is. He certainly is an aggressive rider, though. He gets on with the job. So Cancellara, at the moment, is back in the leader's yellow jersey. I don't think there's too many people going to trouble Fabian Cancellara until he gets to the uh, Plateau de Belfi on Saturday, and that is going to be a nasty test. The first time that we really get to see mm. how good Cadell Evans is and how good is Bradley Wiggins, and, of course, all the other pre-race contenders like Levi Leipheimer, Robert Kessing, and, of course, Frank Schleck, who I think is riding this race like a leader, although he's playing down his chances. I think that's what he, exactly what he's doing. He's playing down his chances at the moment. Well, we'll see. Incidentally, the, the women's tour of Italy is running at the moment, and an American, their second stage win there, Shelley Olds of the United States, who's just been named on the American Olympic team for her first Olympic Games, has won the stage, beating none other than the, the Marianne Voss, who really is the only Mercs of women's cycling. And uh, Stevens, um, in, uh, Stevens is also a second overall, Evelyn Stevens at 144. Sir uh, Philippe Gilbert with the uh, bandages on his uh, elbow and his, uh, on his uh, shin. That's a nasty cut he's got on his shin. He, he actually posted a photograph of it on his Twitter site this morning and it's, uh, the scratch has taken the skin off from just below the knee right the way to the top of the ankle. Yeah, it's a very, very painful, I would imagine, that's and dreadfully so. Anyway, he didn't show it when he came back to the car for a new shoe. They have to carry everything in those team cars, for the, even for the most unlikely happening of needing a new shoe. <laughs> well, you never know what's going to happen. All the riders actually have what they call their race car bag, and in that race car bag they've got a spare raincoat, a spare pair of shoes, spare pair of sunglasses, uh, warm gloves, uh, dry gloves, anything you need that might get destroyed out on the road of the Tour. Well, they've only had that one swift rainstorm today and it's dried out again. There's no more rain forecast, but I'm not sure that was even forecast. Sonny's out at Rouen on the side of the River Seine. These are the three leaders, but the gap is coming down. Another eight seconds has disappeared in the last uh, kilometre of the road. They're being caught. So... Just looking at uh, Anthony Delaplace here on the Seyou Sojourn team. Second time in a long breakaway for him. And the second time he's going to get caught, I'm afraid, because the gap is now beginning to come down. 152 and holding at the moment. So as we watch these uh, three riders up front, I think we can go back into the Orica Green Edge uh, team car with our car cam. There is Matty White. See what they're saying to the riders. Guys, the bottom of the climb is kilometre 202. 202. I'd better ask someone in the bottles, otherwise he'll be through. Albert just asked if anyone needed any bottles. Albert's got some bottles and gels. The bottom of the climb is the steepest, guys. It's 5% at the bottom and 2% at the top. Big open roads, and you'll be able to easy to move up, guys. Uh, so stay together uh, on the climb. Uh, And it's going to be very fast all the way to the finish from the top of the climb. So we're in the, we're, so we're in the mid. Big open roads, stay together, right hand side. So Matt White, himself uh, a tall rider, just telling the whole team there what the situation is, uh, how far to go once they top this climb, it's going to be fast to the finish. He's offered them a chance for somebody to drop back and get any more drinks bottles they require. That, uh, once they hit 20 kilometres from the finish, that rule uh, doesn't apply. They can't go back uh, to the team cars after that time, which is 12 miles out from home. This is the man who's setting the pace and has been the strong man in the breakaway as it's turning out. Yukia Arashio from Japan and rides for the French Europe car team. It looks as though Delaplace is still willing to work. Uh, I think uh, Moncoutier is just staying up here now. He's not, he knows that with his experience of 11 tours, they're not going to survive to the end now, so I don't think he's quite doing the amount of work he was earlier. Moncoutier there, 32% of the work rates uh, at the moment, as we look to hear at the legs of the young Japanese sprinter, Yukia Arashio. And the peloton now 
again that's rocking style of Jens Voigt who's pulling them along once more doing an incredible job if you uh, want to give um, if we could in this game if we could give a man of the match we would have to go I think we'd have to have it for two for two riders it would have to go to Jens Voigt yeah. and Yaroslav Popper for the amount of work that they've done but not only the amount of work the speed that they come to the front out they really dish out the pain Big Matt have done a fair amount of work over the last uh, few uh, minutes because they've got about 30% of the workload. Radio Shack, which is two riders, 24% of the work. But it's interesting that Katusha, Orica Greenedge and Lotto Belisol have also been involved in the pacemaking. Well, as they go under another banner here, which is the 20 kilometres to go banner, and they're running alongside the River Sens banks right now. These are the three leaders, a lovely crowd to cheer the riders through the last miles of the day here they're still working together but the gap 142 now it's scary phil uh, the almost precision like uh, assassination of this breakaway at the moment over the last 10 kilometers or seven miles exactly one minute has been wiped off the advantage of the three leaders they'll probably do the same again over the next 10 kilometers and you could be right we may well see the rejoining happening just on the slopes of that final little yeah. ripple on the outskirts of rouen that's the River Seine over there to the uh, right-hand side, and you can bring some. You can actually bring ocean-going vessels right the way up to the heart of Rouen. Then you have to stop and uh, move everything into uh, smaller barges, but you can take the barges right the way up uh, a long way into the heart of France, well beyond the city of Paris. And this again is Orica Greenedge uh, doing a lot of work. Sebastian Langeveld, the new signing by Greenedge, uh, really working well here. Number 17 and number 18 there, you can see just having a little chat there, Yaroslav Popovic and Jens Voigt, I think their job of work done for the day. Look at the orange jerseys uh, getting together, that's Uskatel Uskadi, we don't expect to see very much of that team, it's a team from the Basque country, the northern part of Spain, uh, they, uh, they are much more likely to shine once we get into the big mountain stages of the Jura, the Alps, and then of course their home ground, their stomping ground is the Pyrenees. Well, this is now eyes down for the final run in here. And let's hope that they keep themselves safe. Yesterday they were falling off all over the place. Now the peloton are under that 20 kilometers to go banner. 136 is the gap. It was 142 when the leaders went under it. So another six seconds has gone away. Just doing good, steady tempo here all of the time. This is Francis de Greff, the rider in second place uh, behind in the Lotto team. That's his job as workhorse as well. Well, the Seine looks calm and tranquil today, but the peloton now are becoming ruffled and angry. They certainly are. This next little town that we make our way through here is Duclair, the department number 76, as you can see there. There's a long tail of riders at the back of that group there, Phil, who are just hoping to survive and just hoping to stay in contact if they can. Minute 30, the gap now, 18 kilometers out. Well, we're looking along the beauty here of the River Seine, and that's where we'll finish today now. And the riders in the peloton just passed under 20 kilometers to go. The three leaders, and still a lot of work being done by the man in green from Japan, Arishiro. They are about one and a quarter kilometers in front of the bunch. Well, as we look at the peloton now, let me remind you, to make sure to sign up for our Discovery Card Fantasy Challenge. This is at NBCSports.com slash challenge for the chance to win the grand prize, a Cervelo R5 or an S5 bike. And if you win today's stage, you'll receive an ASOS F113 clothing kit courtesy of CompetitiveCyclist.com. That's the Discovery Card Fantasy Challenge. Now, this is where we're going next. This is a bit busy at the moment as the caravan is arriving here in Rouen. This is where we're headed to now. We'll take a break. And when we come back, we'll bring them all home. And guess who will win? Will it be Cavendish or will it be Saga? Strava segment of the day, the Route du Clair, offers the non-sprinters one final springboard from which to launch an opportunist attack. Despite being a sprinter stage, today's race has very little truly flat road and features a twisting short climb just a few miles from the finish. Only a shrewd, savvy and strong rider will get away. Log on to Strava.com and see the full profile of the Du Clair and what awaits the peloton. Well, at the moment, they've just passed through the 15 kilometers to go banner, which is nine miles from the finish. 
and uh, very anxious faces in that peloton now they are going very very quickly there's the three leaders the gap is about a minute 62 seconds with the climb we're just talking about that little lump just before the end once over the top of that it's very very rapidly downhill and into the finishing line uh, it's a very fast end to today's stage so we're looking now at the three leaders here Paul sorry three leaders who are away uh, Arashira Moncoutier de la Place battling with each other it looks to me as though de la Place now is really under pressure but we're inside a minute now 56 seconds and coming down well I tell you what Phil there this uh, last 15 kilometers is going to take these riders inside of 20 minutes they go they'll cover 10 miles inside of 20 minutes at the average speed that they're riding just now Oh, there's the peloton. The yellow car up front is right up behind the leaders. Yes, the camera foreshortens it a little bit, but they are coming now. The USA flag flying on the left of the road. It was an American who won the stage on July the 4th last year, Tyler Farrup. He's in the race again. We'll see if he can get up in the sprint. Cadell Evans with those flashes on his sleeve, dead centre of the road. He's riding superbly. He's using his team to keep him safe and out of trouble. He's not interested in winning the day. And he's not interested in being involved in any accidents and losing time because it's all about the time. He's always got a block of riders around him. People questioned uh, what he was doing when he changed teams from some of the biggest teams in the sport to go to BMC, which at the time was a small American team racing only on the American circuit. Then all of a sudden, they swelled, and over the years, they've become now definitely one of the biggest teams on the international circuit. They have. They've signed some great riders this year, and they've signed them to help Cadell Evans win this year's Tour de France and repeat his victory. The peloton are now spread gutter to gutter across that road as they try to hunt down these three riders before we get to this little climb just short of the finish. Just the way the main field is reacting, Phil, I'm pretty certain there's not going to be too much of a problem for these sprinters because it's a, a roller coaster type climb. Uh, Peter Sagan is always sitting very close to the front end of the main field. He's waiting to see whether the three men or where the three men are actually going to get caught. Yes, uh, these are the three leaders and looking at the Sargon in the peloton there, he is riding very, very close, as he did the other day, to Mark Cavendish. Well, he knows the wheels to follow, but uh, the job that he has to do is to try and get around Mark Cavendish when it comes down to the finish. The difficult, I'm, I'm not sure that Mark Cavendish would be the right wheel to follow. I would rather try and find the wheel of Andre Greipel or Matthew Goss, because those two guys have both got very good lead-out trains. Cavendish is riding like a free agent. Now, just take a look at the peloton here, Paul. A little bit of a lull, the movement of the riders on the right to reposition quickly before the racing goes flat out again. Everybody, by the way, from the crash we saw, they are all back in the peloton. There's no one behind. Peloton now spreading out across the road, an indication they've taken a little bit of pressure off the organization now, as they now know they can see, they can almost reach out and touch. That 40 seconds uh, corresponds to about 600 meters. We have 50 seconds, the blackboard shows. The hearts are sinking down to their cycling shoes now because having led by eight minutes, the perfection, the metronome, the minds of the peloton, they're going to catch these boys almost in sight of the finishing line again. Yep, uh, slowly but surely, it's only a second at a time. A uh, second here and a second there, but that's all it takes to pull back this three-man breakaway. Arashiro is the man on the front in the green jersey there. He's the man who started this move, Phil, as soon as the neutralised flag was pulled in. Uh, we're passing here the Abbey of Saint-Georges de Bocheville as uh, they're on the right side of the riders here. The history of that ch ch abbey there goes back to the 12th and 13th century and it's got a wooden vault inside of the nave which was replaced by a Gothic stone vault in 1235. Excellent, thank you Paul. Now we'll go back to the race if our cameras can find where the riders have just moved on to where the gap is now 31 seconds here. That's all it is between those three riders. It looks like the catch is going to be on the climb. Looks like that's exactly what they're lining themselves up to. That climb for the three riders in the breakaway is going to feel like a mountain, probably like Alpe d'Huez if you like. You can see now they've cut, they've cut it off. Now we're getting the organization coming from Lotto Bellisol. Now I wonder if Andre Greipel did not participate in that intermediate sprint because he wanted to keep all of his energy for the final sprint of the day. That for me is exactly what has happened because Andre wants to race wherever he can. I think he wants a stage win more than anything right now and he wants to beat it, uh, Mark Cavendish at the same time 
He certainly does. Uh, he's a, a very strong, consistent sprinter, Andre Greipel. But the thing is, you're going to have two teams trying to drag strip their uh, sprinter into the final corners. And that's going to be uh, Orica Greenedge, who are looking after Matty Goss. And of course, Lotto Bellisol will be looking after Andre Greipel. But what Mark Cavendish has got to do is take advantage of his former teammates who are actually being led out by somebody else. Little look to the left there over the shoulder of Arishido. He knows they're coming now. It's only a matter of time before they do catch them up. Another fine piece was this by the local pompier, the fireman here. Down in the village of Saint Martin. Oh, a little move here from uh, De La Place. He wants to uh, extend his advantage if he can. And this is on the early slope to that little roller of a climb, but he's only 17 seconds. We're looking now at the leaders as they've just started to get in sight of the peloton. The leaders have started to split up. This is an attack now. This is Grifko again from the peloton launching an attack. Well, Grifko was high up in the overall standings after a very good individual prologue, but he lost some time uh, the other day after he'd been in that long, long breakaway. This is a powerful move by him, but he will not ruffle the feathers, I don't think, of the organization in the main pack. But look at this now. We're on the climb. It's only a small little climb, this, but they are trying desperately to get over the top. We are now 10 kilometers from the finish. That's six miles from the line. Well, from the top of the climb, Phil, it's going to take them around about uh, 10 or 11 minutes only to get down towards the finishing line as the 15 second gap is still there coming across there are a few more riders the, the men in the main field now must not panic the sprinkers have to really hold on to their boots so Grifko's uh, launched the attack from the peloton he's got some takers here as well Arishiro is in trouble as the two Frenchmen try to ride for home now past the Spanish flags no Spanish riders in our camera lens at the moment. In fact, Arishiro has clawed his way back. Now, once over the top, it is very, very rapidly downhill towards Rouen. We just spotted the uh, South African flag just at the side of the road. They're flying high in support of Robbie Hunter and Daryl Impey. But again, there's a little move coming up. This is Philippe Gilbert. Well, good for Philippe. Despite the injury down his left shin, Philippe Gilbert is trying to reach them. This is a, the sort of opportunist move he would make. Well, you know, he was uh, my tip to try and win the stage yesterday. He went down in that very nasty crash. And I thought there wasn't another chance left in this bike race for Philippe Gilbert. But once you put a little climb on the running towards the finish, he has got the power this is the Philippe Gilbert Phil of 12 months ago absolutely and these are the moves that last year led to 24 race victories for him the other riders who are looking at each other at the moment here number 88 is David Moncoutier being come brought back now is he going to be able to have the legs to get onto the train I'm not sure well this man here has not got any friends at all he's getting some race uh, information coming from his team manager there probably saying go on full on now you've got the big chance here with a slight advantage over the main field but you know what Phil I don't th I think it's all going to come back together anyway well, Gilbert, if anybody can do it, it is Gilbert. And what a great ploy, too, by Team BMC, who are the rest of them are looking after the leader, Cadell Evans. Oh, oh, Chavanel is the next man to come forward there. That's the man in the pale blue jersey just in front. He is in second position overall, tied on time with Bradley Wiggins. He only needs seven seconds advantage, but the main field, Phil, they are just about ready to pounce. The other riders up here are Pino and uh, Buet who's also come across as they're now looking as though the peloton's taking a greater interest. They're almost over the hill. We will start to run down now, and it'll have to be done by the sprinters' teams uh, to bring these riders back. It looks to me very much as if it's uh, Orica Greenedge are getting themselves very organized on the front end of that big mass of riders hovering around in the middle in the yellow jersey as Fabian Cancellara. There he is, no threat at all. Over on the right-hand side, that is the line of Orica Greenedge. It's almost all back together, and David Moncoutier can see his own teammate now coming up alongside him. Well, they led today for 200 kilometers, but it's every man for himself now as they've been swept up by the advanced scouts from the peloton. The peloton, I think, will come after them straight away now. Well, another move coming once again from Kofidis, but it's pretty much all together. As soon as they regroup, Phil, you will start to see the same teams of the sprinters getting themselves organized to prevent any more of these flurries of attacks. The liquid gas uh, team, no, sorry, the, um, the Lamprey team down there of Alessandro Pataki have suddenly appeared up on this now is Chavanel in second wheel and uh, Samuel Dumoulin is the rider in red he's a sprinter as well and a former stage winner in this region of France uh, in the Tour de France uh, but they're only dangling in front yes he was a winner of a stage in Nantes you've got to take your hat off to Sylvain Chavanel he really is an aggressive bike rider he's looking for any possible opportunity oops nasty bit of traffic furniture once again somebody's caught in the middle 
riding right on the crest of that traffic circle. Well, he's got out of it and uh, flicked down onto the left-hand side of the road, but there are, again, dangerous moments as they run down to the last few kilometres of the race. Next banner they'll see is five kilometres to go, then they'll get the countdown kilometre by kilometre. Sammy de Moulin, one of the smallest riders in the race, but he can pedal a bike quickly, followed by Sylvain Chavanel, the rider who almost stole the show yesterday in Boulogne-sur-Mer. Well, Sammy de Moulin had a pretty good season last year with six victories to his credit, but he, he won the opening race of the season in France this year in the Grand Prix d'Ouverture de Marseille. As we see now, one of the survivors of the breakaway going straight out through the back of the main field. That was Bryce Fellu also getting dropped. Still three riders. I'm not too sure who that rider is uh, from the Vacon Celebre. It could well be Wouter Poles, who's got himself onto the back of this team, of this breakaway. He's a big man. Uh, the peloton is not able to work since he come across though he's just sitting there waiting to see if this break makes any progress now there's the orange and uh, blue jerseys of rabba back there looking after mark renshaw we could in fact phil here this afternoon have three individual lead outs by the teams who've got sprinters and it's a sort of course that can cope with that sort of a, a different set of lead out teams coming into the finish Big wide bridge when we cross the River Seine shortly and it's the last kilometre as they run into the finish. Here we go. Well, that's the bridge that they will cross the over bridge. in a short while there, Phil. They'll swing over to the right and then left and it's a straight shot at the finishing line. A lot of movement again and Rabobank are trying to do this today for Mark Renshaw. They've got themselves quite well organised just at the minute but they've still got a fight on their hands. These uh, riders have chosen an opportunist time to move and they won't give up easily. The rider from Vacon Soleil who just flicked his wrist there to try and get some help and a cooperation with the other riders as well to pools of Vacon Soleil. They've got an advantage of around about six or seven seconds but there's still very good organisation in the peloton. It's very, very rare that a breakaway manages to survive in a situation like this on the running towards the finish because the peloton can push its pace up to 60 kilometres an hour which is in excess of 40 miles an hour. This is the long descent now where they use the biggest gear they've got on the bike and they'll hit speeds as Paul has said in excess of 40 miles an hour, 70 kilometers plus. The peloton, just look at the speed of them coming down. This is a perfect road for a real flat out chase. Well to put it into perspective we've just hit five kilometers to go, that's three miles of racing and Phil that is going to take them not very much more than six minutes. At the most I would think with a lot of it downhill before we run onto the banks of the Seine then we swoop over the river itself and and then we turn left and line up for the line itself. They're saying five seconds. That's a long way to go on the right-hand side. Cancellara said, enough is enough, Mr. Chavanel. I'm going to keep my yellow jersey on my own shoulders <laughs> here this afternoon. I've had Popovich working his heart out. I've had Voigt working his heart out. I'm going to nail this all back and you can come to the finishing line with me. Well, Sylvain Chavanel, just seven seconds he requires, exactly what he required yesterday. They took it back before the finish, and now the peloton are taking it back again. Well, that was a little uh, flurry of activity by Fabian Cancellara. Now it's other teams moving forward. We've still got in the second, third, fourth, fifth position, you've got Lotto Bellisol. The last rider, theoretically, to launch Andre Greipel into the lead was going to be Greg Henderson, the Kiwi rider, riding in his first Tour de France. They are swept up at four kilometres to go. Uh, Mr. Windmill on the left is just about to be caught back as well. Sammy Dumoulin. And now it is Lamprey, and they're riding for Alessandro Pataki. 176 wins in his career as a cyclist. Uh, but he's going to have to take on the best boys in the world. Because if you look down the ladder there, Paul, you'll see the white jersey of, uh, of Mark Cavendish. And right on his wheel again is the green jersey of Peter Sagan. But he's on the wheel of Bernie. Isol, the rider in front of him in the white jersey with a black strip down the middle. Uh, these two men have uh, managed to get themselves through another stage. Uh, Ma Tony Martin, 196, Luis Leon Sanchez, 155. There with Tommy Danielson also. I'm afraid our riders in the surgery at the back and with the broken bones have dropped off the back of the peloton to ride in, but that's fine by them today. Uh, this is the dangerous part of the race now as the sprinters want to gain their day before the mountains take away the flat roads of the Tour de France. There's a lot of movement again, but Paul, they must be coming down here now in excess of 55 kilometers. Now they're back. Oh, they've gone a down. Big, again, a touch of wheels. Gone down. And Cavendish is in the middle of that one at the moment. And so too, I think, is Boyce and Argon. But they've gone down in that pileup. Again, a touch of wheels in the middle of the race. Sargon was uh, in the middle there, and he went down. And under who went down, they went just down in front there. Cavendish had somebody uh, in front of him, and he, he tried. I think he got round. 
Well, well, we'll check again, but certainly Robbie Hunter again has gone on the ground. He's been in three crashes yesterday. You know what? I thought that was the jersey of the world champion, but in fact it was Robbie Hunter's jersey of the uh, uh, South African champion. So Hunter went down. Now it's going to be a chance for Lotto Bellisol. No, he's is down, down on the ground. Cavendish. It is Cavendish. Sadly, he's down. Uh, it's looking good job a little bit stunned at the moment. It's good job he had a helmet on. Look at the way that's been ripped to pieces. Uh, this is the drama at the back there. Cavendish was in an ideal position. There's some serious argy bar and I don't know how, but Peter Sargonfield was on the ground and he's back in the group. Well, Sargon went round, he was right on Cavendish's wheel, so I'm not too sure how on earth he didn't get involved in the crash. Uh, but we're looking at uh, 1.7 kilometres to go. The only good news for the riders, it was inside the three kilometre rule. So they all get the same time, those riders, uh, when they do come in. But I don't think they're really worried about that right now. We need to get down there now. And still, Alessandro Pataki is down there at the moment. And Matthew Goss is still down there, as far as we can see. It looks as though Tom Velas is still there for the, um, for the Shimano boys in white as well. Yeah, but Phil, there are still four riders from Lotto Bellisol now. This is their lead out the fourth man in that line now is Andre Greipel in front of him it's the Kiwi Greg Henderson he said the other day oh we were so close and he's today going to try and make sure he delivers his man into the ideal position Cavendish has got to get himself to the finish a bit of chaos at the back end but this is the bridge now they've got a headwind they will turn left off this bridge and they will face up to 900 meters to go this is all control now for this team Lotto Bellisol still in fourth position but locked onto his wheel is Alessandro Pataki they swing into the home straight now in the distance is the finishing line Andre Greipel is fourth wheel, but Alessandro Pataki is fifth wheel, and then Peter Sagan is in there as well. And Goss is moving up. There's a split in the peloton, and the final lead out now. This is Adam Hansen trying to lead out the last man to go. Will be Andre Greipel. He may have his hands full here with Pataki, and moving up as well is uh, Boysenhagen is also behind Pataki. This is a sprinter's delight, and Goss is waiting, waiting, waiting to make the move, and he's making his move now, Matt. Matthew Goss as he runs up the outside. Can Greipel hold off Goss? Sargon is coming up over on the right. Greipel has won this. Pataki can't go round him. Greipel, Pataki on the line. Well, thank you very much, Greg Henderson. That was a sprint for 200 metres to go for Greg Henderson. He pulled off and let Alex Andre Greipel get the victory. That was a well-timed acceleration. How happy are these men? There is Henderson saluting there. I think the uh, rider behind there was Tom Velas in the white jersey as well. Well, so a good result for him, but this is a sad sight. You know, that was still out on the highway is that the World Championship jersey for, but Greipel is the man. He's got the victory today. He may be totally unaware that Cavendish has crashed, but he must have wondered where he was in the sprint in that case. Well, let's just have a look. Uh, this is how you take a textbook sprint to the line. Now, you can see that's Greg Henderson. He will be sprinting his heart out there to try and look as far as he can, to try and take his man as close as he can to the finish. And now, all of a sudden, he launches Andre Greipel in an ideal position. If this had been 10 years ago, the man in the pink jersey there, Alessandro Pataki, would have come whipping by Andre Greipel. But no, he's getting a little bit long in the tooth to have that last top-end acceleration. He still challenges, but Greipel was all the way to the line there. And that was a great move by uh, Greg Henderson, I have to say. And the whole team, Lotto Belisov. Poor old Mark Cavendish, though. He's not going to be a happy camper this afternoon because that could very no. easily have been another victory for him. And thank heavens he's not injured with the Olympics coming up as well. Peloton coming in, they sat up, uh, I would delay by the crash, if they were delayed by the crash, they would all be given at the same time. Uh, but uh, Tom Wheelers did snatch the third place there, and Matthew Goss fourth, and in fifth place was Peter Sagan. Uh, Goss left it too late there to make that run, and Greipel made it look rather easy in the end. Yeah, well, uh, we'll uh, find out the stories of uh, how that crash actually happened there. And at uh, one stage, it looked as if uh, a couple of the riders were going to get themselves uh, around the, the danger. And the yellow jersey coming in all smiles. Yeah, well, he was in the uh, group. He was just at that point where the crash, it was just about in front of him. So he's delayed by that crash. So he will also be given the same time as the group he was with at the time. Yeah. And he will be with the leaders. And he knows that. He knows the rules. So he's going straight to the podium to get himself another yellow jersey. Yes, they'll get the same time because the crash, as Paul says, a three-kilometre rule is applied. By the way, if a teammate who isn't involved in the crash turns round and goes back to help an injured teammate, he actually loses time. The rule doesn't apply to those riders, only applies to those delayed by the actual crash. Look at this now. That's Greg Henderson. He's a pretty happy man. That was a very impressive First sprint that France. he did. There he is, got his hands in the air. He enjoyed that, and he's the man who... He was the last man to set it up. 
Terrific, and that's there, by the way, is Andre Greipel's 15th win of the year. He's keeping pace with Peter Sagan for sure. Here's the arrival of Mark Cavendish. He's in the straight now, as we can see, as we look around the area of the uh, early in the finish. Great finish for a sprinter too, wasn't it? Ideal sprinter, uh, ideal finish. And there's a, I tell you what, uh, if you have a look at uh, Mark Cavendish's helmet, it really got uh, smashed to pieces there. Confirmation then, uh, Greipel ahead of Pataki, Vilas, Gost, Sagan. Jonathan Cantwell up there in sixth place and Daryl Impey of, uh, or, or, of um, Oregon Green Edge, Green Edge yeah. in seventh place. Not a bad ride by him. A very, very good ride by the South African. Two South Africans in the race and Robbie Hunt has had more than his first share of fours just now. Mark Cavendish continues along the key as he heads up. No change in the overall, at least uh, it's provisional, but I'm quite sure there'll be no change in the overall. They will all be given the time gaps as was at the start of the day. Yep, and, uh, poor old Mark Cavendish though, because uh, as you can see, he's uh, ripped up pretty badly. It doesn't look as if he's uh, too injured. I think more than anything else, it will be his pride that will be injured. So he's probably going to come out a rather angry man tomorrow when it comes up. And this is the, the fact is, Phil, because he's having to sprint on his own, in the, in the past when he's had a lead-out train on the former HTC squad, they will have lined it out and kept him nice and safe. But there he was having to get involved in the argy-bargy in the middle of the pack. Well, it was a very nasty high-speed fall as well, and that for those riders that did hit the deck, uh, we're lucky we're not reporting somebody with serious injuries. They were flat out when that accident happened. The riders themselves will assess what happened, and they'll find out, because they, if riders are touching wheels and not paying attention, there'll be some discussions about that amongst themselves, for sure. Well, that's Daniel Oss as well. He's uh, the lead-out man for Peter Sargon. He was also involved in that little accident there, and he's dragged himself up to the finish line. We'll find out a little bit later on what that was all about because I'm sure somebody will be to blame for that little incident. But the winner, Andre Greipel, win number 15 and brings his total to 91 career wins. He is a great sprinter. His winning all started in, uh, in uh, Australia in January when he won the Down Under Classic and then he won three stages of the Tour Down Under itself. And he's been winning ever since. So now he's got 15 to his credit. All right, let's have a look then at the uh, confirmation of the results. Uh, long day in the saddle today for the riders. Five hours, 18 minutes for Greipel. Pataki getting his best finish so far. Tom Veal has had a fourth. Now he's had a third. Matthew Goss in fourth place. Uh, Peter Sagan in fifth. Goss may have lost his best chance to win today in the absence of, uh, of Mark Cavendish there. Sixth place, a newcomer to the tour, but he is a very, very good sprinter. Jonathan Cantwell, he's from Queensland in Australia. He's got the sixth place uh, finish today. Dal Impey, another first time in the tour, up for seventh. Edward Boysenhagen there crossing the line in ninth. Coming up, the proform.com post race report. We're bringing the podium standings and uh, any stories we can find out about what has happened out on course today. At least Cancellara believes he's in yellow because he's gone behind the podium to get ready. Well, the crashes won't stop, will they? We'll be back in a minute. Enjoy the Tour de France with us here, here on NBC Sports. See you in a moment. Welcome back and welcome to, to the Proform post-race report here now as we uh, try to pick up the bits after yet another crash on the run-in. As the riders themselves today have really had another rough ride into the finish. The world champion Mark Cavendish among the fours this time and the day's win of course, his 15th hit of the season was the German rider Andre Greipel. We're having a quick spin around the beautiful cathedral of Notre Dame de l'Assomption here right in the centre of uh, Rouen. The riders are finishing on the other side of the river but more or less in the shadow of this beautiful cathedral. Then we can have a quick look at that crash again before we go to all the uh, final standings. Right in the centre of the race, keep concentrating there. You'll see Peter Sagan in the green jersey just get away with it on the right hand side of the picture. Uh, and right in the centre, the two champions, the South African champion Robbie Hunter went down and also, that looks like Sargon on the floor down there, he must have got up very, very quickly. If it, it can't be Sargon on the floor, it must be a leaky gas rider who has gone down there. And here's from the front, looking the centre of the picture now, as they all dive around. It was the rider that hit, actually, a rider on the inside of Robbie Hunter took Robbie Hunter out 
And there you see on the green, Sorden got around the whole ricochet in that green jersey and was still able to get himself up to the finishing sprint. But he crossed the line in fifth or sixth place. We'll check that out in a moment. All right, well, let's have a look now at our road ID ride of the day. And it's all about the sprint finish today. Andre Greipel uh, with, in the absence of Mark Cavendish. And he's just said, by the way, that he didn't know Mark Cavendish was out of the hunt in a crash. Greipel crosses the line there, punches there. Big lead out by the New Zealand rider. Uh, Greg Henderson for him and then launched him off. Pataki tried, but he simply didn't have it at all. And Andre Greipel gets his Tour de France stage win today for this year. That was the welcome they got at the finish. Greg Heisen won. That was our road ID, ride of the day. And don't forget, if you want a chance to win daily prizes and a 2013 Trek Madon, head on over to roadid.com slash ride and make your prediction for tomorrow's stage winner. So don't forget, as we watch uh, Rouen begin to uh, return to normal here, we uh, have our primetime program tonight and we'll have a lot of information on what has happened and analyse that crash tonight. And that comes to you, as always, at the regular time, 8 p.m. Eastern time, for our Tour de France primetime show on the NBC Sports Network. We'll include everything we can't show you here on our live show on the Tour de France. Well, the overall won't change because the referees uh, will give all of the riders involved in that tumble or delayed by that tumble the same time as the winner today, which means there'll be no change in the overall classification. But I think we can now go to Craig Hummer because he's talking with TJ Van Garderen. TJ, from the video, it looked like that crash happened right in front of you. I know in an instant like that, it's mostly reactions, but what did you see? Uh, it's, you know, not much. I just, you don't really have time to think. You're just kind of holding your brakes and trying to stay balanced. Uh, I was lucky I didn't go down and lucky it was inside the 3K. Um, so we got the same time, but man, it was, it was scary. It's another good example, isn't it, of with your job to protect Cadell, it never finishes until the finish line. Yeah, it's true. I mean, we're always, uh, it's always 100% concentration. You have to stay focused all day. I mean, even if it's relaxed and it seems like not a dangerous moment, you know, anything could happen. I know you grew up watching the Tour de France on July 4th. Any messages for your friends and family back home? I just, uh, yeah, happy, happy 4th and, uh, yeah, too bad I'm missing out on the barbecues and the beers, but, uh, Hope they're having fun. All right, on to tomorrow. All right, thanks. <laughs> well done, TJ. He's in his second Tour de France. He remains the best rookie. I think we can go to the stage podiums now. I can hear the music, and there he is. Win number one this year for him in the Tour de France. Win number 15 of the season. He started winning in January this year, and he now receives the applaud of the crowd here in Rouen. Médaillé de bronze au championnat du monde qui reçoit l'accueil de la Normandie, André Greipel. So, André Greipel, he's coming up uh, 30 years of age uh, during the Tour de France. He'll have his birthday on the 16th of July, so 12 days to go uh, inside 30 years of age as he goes across to shake hands there with Bernard Tevenet, twice a winner of the Tour de France. The man has just gone off our picture to the left and the dignitaries here in the city of Rouen. There is Bernard Tevenet and this is the Mid Globe Ultra overall standings.